Hello everyone and welcome to the SQL injection attacks course here at INE. My name is Alexis Ahmed and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. Now, before we actually begin with the course, what I like doing is going through a course introduction that will not only show you what we'll be covering in this course at a high level, but also touch on some of the prerequisites for the course because I think that's very important as well as the learning objectives for the course. The idea being to show you what we'll be covering and to highlight the learning objectives or the outcomes for the course. Now, why is this useful or why do I like going through this exercise? Well, the reason I like doing this is for a sense of accountability in that we're going to see what we'll be covering and then I'm going to go over what you should be able to do by the end of the course. And we will be revisiting the learning objectives for this course uh, at the end of the course during the course conclusion video to actually see whether we touched on everything that we were supposed to do or that we were supposed to cover. With that being said, let's get started with a few formalities. Who am I and what makes me qualified uh, to teach this course? As some of you may know, my name is Alexis Ahmed. I am a senior penetration tester and red team at Hackersploit. I'm also the offensive security instructor here at INE. If you, if you wish to reach out to me, you can do so via my email or my social media handles, which have been linked to this slide. If you have a question pertinent to this particular course and to this learning path for this certification, uh, you can send me a message or you can create a thread on the official uh, INE community forums where I'm very active with students. So if you have any question related to this course or anything covered within the course, you can uh, you know send me a message on the forums and you can find the forum at community.ine.com. Uh, just create a profile, send me a message or create a new thread under this particular learning path or certificate and I'll be more than happy to get back to you as soon as possible. With that being said, now that we have all of the formalities out of the way, let's get started by getting a an idea as to what the uh, course outline is going to be, or the, rather the course topic overview, which gives you a high level understanding as to what we'll be covering in this course. So this is going to be quite a comprehensive course with regards to SQL injection. Uh, the objective for this course, the primary objective for this course is to uh, provide you with the knowledge, information and skills, as well as abilities to be able to identify and exploit different types of SQL injection vulnerabilities in the wild. So regardless as to whether you're a penetration tester, web app penetration tester, bug bounty hunter, as well as a developer or someone who works in web application security, this course will have an intrinsic value to you uh, because I'll be covering quite a lot that you typically wouldn't find in another course. So firstly, we'll get started with an introduction to SQL injection. Again, fairly simple, very, very important that you understand what the vulnerability is, what its classification is in terms of the OS top 10, uh, the risk factors, the impact, etc. And then we'll touch on the types of SQL injection vulnerabilities. Again, very, very important, something that is really misunderstood by a lot of people uh, getting into the cybersecurity industry. It can be a little bit confusing to understand the different types because there isn't a formal uh, there isn't a formal organization available that sort of breaks it down in a way that is easy to understand. That's what I'm going to be seeking to do with regards to that section or that video. I'm then going to turn my attention to providing you with an introduction to databases. So sort of explaining what a database is, what it's used for and why web applications utilize databases. And then we'll also get an introduction to database management systems. So sort of uh, taking or moving further with regards to databases and now explore, uh, explaining or exploring what a database management system is. Once we've understood that, we'll then turn our attention to the common types of databases, one of which being relational databases and NoSQL databases. The reason we'll be touching on relational databases and NoSQL databases is these are the primary data, uh, databases associated with SQL injection, even in the case of NoSQL database. So relational databases are your typical SQL databases. And again, don't worry if you're not understanding this, uh, any of this right now, we're going to get to that. And again, you might be wondering to yourself, why exactly are we covering databases? Well, SQL injection deals with injecting SQL queries or SQLI payloads into databases and having them executed in order to obtain data. It would be counterintuitive to try and learn SQL injection without understanding how databases work, specifically relational databases, 
And uh, if you skip over that, you really aren't going to have a good idea as to what you're doing and what some SQL statements mean uh, and how they're executed by the database. So once we get an intro to, to databases, we're now going to move on to the primary language used by SQL databases, which is the structured query language. So we'll take a look at the fundamentals of SQL. So we'll get an intro as to what it is, how it's used uh, with regards to interaction between the web application and the database, and how SQL queries are executed by the databases, the key uh, SQL queries, uh, queries to be aware of, the key keywords or the key SQL syntax you need to be aware of when performing SQL injection, so on and so forth. So that I would call the first section of this course. It's going to be an introductory section uh, that will be a mix of both theory and practical and arguably the most important. The reason it's going to be the most important is because once you've gone through the first section, you can go ahead even at that point and then use any guide online or any guide available online to begin uh, hunting and exploiting SQL injection vulnerabilities. This is something that a lot of people jump over or skip over, but if you understand how databases work and how SQL works, SQL injection becomes very simple to execute because you now understand how to write basic SQL queries, you know about encoding, so on and so forth. So the next section will be, of course, hunting for SQL injection vulnerabilities. I'll show you how to identify SQL injection vulnerabilities, their types, and how to exploit them with regards to the type of info you're looking for. We'll then move on to active exploitation. Well, I'll show you how to identify and exploit in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities. The subtypes of in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities are, of course, going to be error-based SQL injection and union-based SQL injection. We'll then turn our attention to identifying and exploiting blind SQL injection vulnerabilities, where the subtypes are going to be time-based and Boolean-based SQL inj injection. We'll then wrap up the course by taking a look at how to automate the identification and exploitation of SQL injection vulnerabilities through the use of automated tools and frameworks like SQL Map. And then finally, we'll touch on how we can uh, pen test or perform injections against NoSQL databases like Redis, so on and so forth. And of course, we'll get to that point when we get there. The focus, however, is going to be primarily on SQL databases. I'm adding the NoSQL database section because NoSQL databases are becoming increasingly popular, especially given their use case and their advantage over a standard relational database. So what are the prerequisites for this course? The prerequisites are very simple. Number one, I just want to make it clear that you don't need any pre, uh, you don't need any prior knowledge with regards to how databases work, how SQL works. That's my job for this course. I'm going to introduce you to all of that. But with regards to other prerequisites, uh, I would recommend uh, that you have a basic familiarity with how the internet works and how a protocol like HTTP or HTTPS works. So because we're interacting with the internet, you need to understand what HTTP requests and responses look like and how they work. Uh, you also need to have some basic familiarity with Linux. The reason this is the case is because we're going to be utilizing some Linux terminal tools or we're going to be working within the Linux terminal primarily. As for other tools or other knowledge that you need to have, I would highly recommend that you have a fundamental familiarity and understanding and understanding of how to use uh, a web proxy, either OSP Zap or Burp Suite. If you are unfamiliar with web proxies or you'd like to get a primer on it, I would highly recommend taking a look at the web proxies course within this learning path for this certificate as I cover how to use both uh, Burp Suite and OSP Zap um, for web application security assessment. So that's a great course if you want to uh, get up to speed uh, on how to use web proxies. So those are the prerequisites. And finally, we have the learning objectives. These are the most important uh, aspects or elements to me. The reason these are important is because I use them as a guide point uh, to develop the course and uh, it allows me to hold myself, uh, myself accountable with regards to what I want you to be able to do after you complete this course. So they're not really important now, but you can go ahead and read them. They're very closely tied to the course topic overview or the topics that we'll be covering, uh, but they're uh, again narrowed down to individual skills or uh, pieces of knowledge that you should have by the end of this course. As I said in the introduction, we are going to be revisiting the learning objectives in the course conclusion to see whether we've covered everything here. So just going over them really quickly, 
The first learning objective involves you having a solid understanding of what SQL injection vulnerabilities are, what causes them, and their potential impact to businesses and business operations. Secondly, you should have an understanding of how relational databases and NoSQL databases work and how they differ from one another. All right. You should also have an understanding of the three categories of or types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and their respective subtypes. So uh, you need to know about the primary types, which are in band, blind, and out of band, and then their subtypes. So, you know, in in band, we have error based as uh, well as union based, and in blind, we have uh, time based and Boolean based, so on and so forth. So you need to understand uh, the differences between the types as well as the subtypes. And uh, moving on, you should be able to understand and write basic SQL queries. Uh, and then moving on to the exploitation, you should be able to uh, you should be able to identify and exploit uh, inbound SQL injection vulnerabilities. Those are error based and union based. And you should also be able to identify and exploit blind SQL injection vulnerabilities. Those being time based and Boolean based SQL injection. And then, of course, you will be able to or you should be able to automate the identification and exploitation of SQL injection vulnerabilities with tools like SQL Map. And finally, you will be able or you should be able to identify and exploit vulnerabilities in NoSQL databases. So NoSQL injection primarily. As I said, the focus of this course is really on SQL injection, specifically with SQL databases or relational databases. The NoSQL database section is added as an addendum uh, as it's something that we'll be covering in other certificates much more deeply. Uh, with that being said, that is the introduction, or this is the introduction to the course. As you can see, it is quite comprehensive. We have a lot to cover. So that's going to be it from my end, and I'm going to be seeing you in the first video in the course. Introduction to SQL injection. So welcome everyone to the official kickoff point for this course. And we're going to be starting off by getting a formal introduction as to what SQL injection is, its uh, classification as a vulnerability, what causes it, as well as a brief history of the vulnerability so you understand where it came from and what the prevalence of the vulnerability or SQL injection attacks is today. And that will lead us to the final section of this video where we'll be exploring uh, the impacts of the vulnerability, the security consequences, as well as the risks posed by the vulnerability from a business or operational perspective. So let's get started firstly by getting an introduction to the vulnerability itself. So what is SQL injection? Well, SQL injection, also abbreviated as SQLI, is a web application injection vulnerability that occurs when an attacker injects malicious SQL statements or queries into an application's input fields. All right, so I really like that definition because it highlights two key important uh, keywords there. The first being that this is an injection vulnerability. Now, if you if you have been performing web app uh, pen testing before, and if you are familiar with the OS top 10 classification of vulnerabilities or the classification types, you may have thought that SQL injection is a an input validation or a lack therein of input validation with regards to the type of vulnerability. However, SQL injection by nature and by virtue of its name is an injection vulnerability in that it uh, essentially allows for the injection of, in this case, SQL queries uh, into the back end of the web application to be therefore or consequently executed by the database, therefore returning data from the database that can then be consumed or used by the attacker for whatever their objectives are. Now, what causes the vulnerability? This is very, very, very important. All right. So you may be thinking that this, um, this vulnerability is really caused by a, an issue with the database uh, or the DBMS, the database management system in and of itself. However, that's not the case because the database will execute anything or any SQL query that is sent over by the back end of the web application. So that's really not the issue. The issue is at the point of injection. So this vulnerability occurs when a web application does not properly validate user input, therefore allowing an attacker to inject SQL, uh, SQL or SQL code or queries that can manipulate the database or gain access to the 
information contained within the database which could be sensitive. So the key thing there is that it's primarily caused by, by a lack of input validation by the web application. So many web applications leverage or utilize databases, right? And the primary way that an attacker identifies and exploits an SQL injection vulnerability is primarily through an application input, a point or an area within the web application where the user can input data that is then processed by the web application and consequently that uh, where the web application interacts with the database. A good example of that is a login form. Why is that a good example? Well, firstly, most web applications today have authentication set up and the typical form of authentication is in the case, is in the form of username, password or email password, right? Now, that website is obviously using some type of database and that database is where the credentials are stored. So an attacker finds the login form and they know that that login form on the web application interacts with the database because of its nature, because of the fact that it's it's uh, requesting a user to put in their data, their username or password that is then verified by the web application by interacting with the database. So the two requirements or parameters for a successful SQL injection attack is that they need there needs to be an input point uh, on the web application and we'll get into input validation. And secondly, that input point needs to have some form of interaction with the database in that it needs to be uh, checking for data in the database or creating new data. It really doesn't matter as long as it's interacting with the database in, uh, in some way or form. That's the second prerequisite, right? Now, the first prerequisite, the you know point of injection or an input point, the primary cause of the vulnerability is not really the database because as I said, the database will execute whatever it's told to execute by the web application. It's really the input validation or the lack therein of input validation on the web application itself. So you can imagine if you're a web developer and you've not done any secure coding and you're building a web application using the LAMP stack, so you know MySQL, PHP, etc., and you develop a PHP web application that has a form of authentication, in, uh, in this case, username and password, um, within the login.php page, you're going to be interacting with the database in that you'll take the data within the username and password and send them to the database to verify whether that user exists, right? Now, if you don't validate or you don't perform any input validation where you prevent the execution of certain keywords or SQL code natively, then an attacker could potentially inject any legitimate or even dangerous SQL queries into any of those input fields and have them injected. The web application doesn't know that it's malicious unless you develop the web application with that in mind or to block those types of, uh, uh, of inputs. Web application doesn't know there's anything wrong with that. It sends it to the database as a query to check whether that username and password exists or whether that user exists. Now, remember the username uh, parameter contains the SQL query. So when passed into the database, the database says, okay, you want me to process this? It goes over to the value of the username parameter and it says, okay, this is a SQL query uh, that was injected by the attacker. It doesn't know that it's been injected by the attacker. It's expecting a username or a string, but it gets that data and the SQL database doesn't know any better. It knows how to execute SQL queries and it does exactly that and returns back the data. Uh, back to the web application, the back end of the web application. The back end of the web application knows how to respond to that and then you know sends back the data to the point of injection or the page where the user had injected that information or any other page um, relevant to the functionality of the web application. So this is sort of the example that I've listed here where suppose a website has a login form that accepts a username and password. If the website does not properly validate the user's input, an attacker could uh, enter a malicious SQL statement into the username field that would allow them to bypass the login process and gain access to the website's database. So that's a very typical uh, example of a SQL injection vulnerability where the attacker leverages this vulnerability to bypass the login form uh, and to log in as a particular user, right? Uh, so essentially just bypassing the entire authentication process, even though, or, you know, primarily, uh, in, certain, in most cases, the fact you know that they don't already have an account on the website, that's really not uh, an issue at that point. They're just able to bypass that authentication process. So that's sort of an intro to the vulnerability. Now, of course, moving on, breaking it down further, given what I've just explained to you, 
you can obviously extrapolate from that that SQL injection attacks can have serious consequences, including the theft of sensitive data, unauthorized access to sensitive systems, and even uh, full system compromise. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, okay, this looks fairly simple to understand. I just need to find a web application that has a database by virtue of its functionality, the fact that it has authentication or that it's storing data and it has an application input that allows uh, an attacker to input SQL queries um, directly into it because of a lack of user uh, val uh, input validation. What's the prevalence of websites that could potentially have or that could potentially be affected by this vulnerability? Well. Going back to the previous slide where I highlighted the requirements for the vulnerability to be executed successfully, uh, one of them is the fact that the website or web application needs to be utilizing a database. Now, if you think about it, why would a web app need a database? Web apps need databases because they need to store different types of data. They need to store data like username or user credentials. They could be storing other data that is required, like references to particular pages or any other any other data or assets that they need stored somewhere, not just so that they can be modified or changed, but also so that they can be referenced. So for example, when you log in to a web application that is using a, a SQL database, uh, more specifically a relational database, what it uh, does when you, uh, when you specify a username and password, uh, it, the web application takes that and you know sends it to the database and says, hey, can you please check and see if this user exists within the users table of the database. If it doesn't exist, you know what to do or you just send me back the result. I, as the web application, know how to respond to the user. Web application typically tells you that either your username is false or your password is false, therefore confirming that the user exists. If you enter the correct password, though the database says, okay, yes, uh, typically through a Boolean response, either true or false says, true, this user exists. Uh, and then it checks the password. Is this the correct one? Does it match? True. The web application says, okay, this is a valid user account and they've provided a valid password and it responds by logging you in and then taking you to your dashboard or your profile page. So again, very, very simple to understand that uh, many web applications today use databases for storing different types of data of vast, you know, vast types and quantities of data. And as a result, these attacks are very prevalent. Now, it doesn't matter what type of database they're using because that'll be a topic that we'll discuss whether they're using a SQL database or a NoSQL database, it really doesn't matter. As long as they're using a database, it is a potential target. Uh, the web application is a potential target, obviously, if it doesn't have any proper input validation. And content management systems or CMSs like WordPress, Drupal, or Joomla are very common examples of this because of the fact that they need a database in order to work correctly for you know different reasons, as we'll obviously see. And the uh, content management systems will typically utilize relational databases. And again, I'll explain what a relational database is as we progress, uh, but they utilize relational databases like MySQL, which is open source, MSSQL, which is Microsoft, SQL Server, Oracle, PostgreSQL, and others. Now, the key thing to note is that in order to interact with databases, specifically SQL databases, entities such as system operators, programmers, or applications and web applications use a language to communicate with SQL databases. And the language that they use is called SQL, also known as the structured query language. That's why databases, uh, in this particular case, SQL databases have the prefix uh, or the word SQL as a prefix to their name or a, as a suffix, because it's very important when choosing what database to use to know whether you're using a SQL database or a NoSQL database, because that tells you what language that database uses with regards to reading data, accessing data, deleting data, modifying data, etc. The point I'm trying to make here is that web applications typically utilize the structured query language to interact with the database so that they can send data to it for storage, they can delete data, so on and so forth. Uh, so on and so forth. And again, as I said, we'll be exploring SQL uh, as a language uh, in its own video or in its own section. So don't worry about that if you're not familiar with it. So we now have sort of a good understanding as to what a SQL injection vulnerability is. 
let's take a, a little bit of a history lesson as to where SQL injection came from as a vulnerability and obviously as an attack. So the term SQL injection was coined by Jeff Forrestal, also known as Rainforest Puppy, in a paper that he presented at the DEF CON 8 conference in the year 2000. So the vulnerability has been there since the advent of the internet or the, you know, the, uh, popular, uh, the popularization of the internet, as well as the, uh, the inception point at which, you know, we started seeing the invention and the use of database driven websites. So Jeff Forrestal was one of the first security researchers to publicly document the SQL injection vulnerability and explain how it could be exploited in order to gain unauthorized access to databases and sensitive information. SQL injection attacks have been around since the early days of web applications and database driven websites. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's been with us for a very long time. It's still prevalent as long as there's a database using or there's a website using a database you're always going to have a form of a database injection attack, regardless as to whether it is a SQL injection attack or a no SQL injection attack. And that can be further explained or illustrated by taking a brief uh, historical view of some very popular or well-known data breaches or attacks that were as a direct result of a SQL injection attack. So in 1998, an attacker known as Rainforest Puppy, also known as Jeff Forrestal, used SQL injection to gain access to a US Department of Energy computer network. In the year 2000, the first publicized SQL injection attack when a hacker used SQL injection to steal credit card data from the website of e-tailer CD Universe. In 2002, a group of Russian hackers known as the Helldiggers, which is a pretty cool name, used SQL injection to gain access to the database of the United Nations, resulting in the theft of sensitive information and data. In 2012, this is a very popular one, the LinkedIn data breach occurred in which attackers used SQL injection to steal 6.5 million user passwords or user credentials. And of course, another popular one in 2015, the Ashley Madison data breach occurred in which attackers used SQL injection to steal sensitive uh, user data from the infidelity dating site. Now, why am I showing you this and why haven't I gone further historically uh, to cover some of the, latest, uh, the, the latest um, SQL injection attacks or data breaches that were a direct result of a SQL injection attack? The reason I haven't gone further is because there's too many, firstly, and secondly, each one of them is big, and that's why I wanted to use this historical view or this histogram, if you will, a very rough histogram, uh, to to show you that whenever there's an uh, whenever there's a SQL injection attack or vulnerability, it always or mostly results in a lot of data being stolen or leaked. All right, so hopefully you're getting my point. It's very, very, very severe for an organization, regardless of whether their website has a small amount of data or whether it has a you know a huge amount of sensitive information it always results in a lot of data being leaked or stolen and consequently sold by attackers as you can see just from this historical view you know dating uh, to 2015 with one of the most popular uh, ones uh, you know one that grabbed the attention of uh, of the public in uh, for different reasons but that was caused by a sql injection attack or vulnerability, which brings me to the impact um, of the vulnerability from a cybersecurity perspective. So if you're aware with cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity utilizes a typical of very well known, very, very powerful triad of pillars that sort of outline the important aspects or factors to consider when securing any asset, regardless of whether it's digital or uh, or, or, or whether it is more ethereal than that. And, and that, of course, is the CIA, the CIA triad, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So how does the SQL injection vulnerability affect the CIA triad? Well, confidentiality, or from the perspective of confidentiality, since SQL databases generally hold sensitive data, a loss of confidentiality is a frequent problem with SQL injection vulnerabilities. So, when you talk about confidentiality as a pillar of the CIA triad, what you're referring to is that access to data or access to a computer or a system should be confidential in that only users or persons with access or privileges or rights 
should be able to see or access that system and no one else, therefore keeping it confidential. SQL injection obviously impacts confidentiality because attackers now gain access to sensitive data that they should previously have never been able to gain access to. Very, very simple to understand. The second pillar, integrity. What is integrity in the context of cybersecurity or the CIA triad? Integrity refers to the fact that data or a system uh, or the data contained within a system should uh, should have its data or rather a system should have its data uh, maintained, its data integrity maintained. So specifically referring to the fact that data or information should not be changed or modified without you know proper p- permission or privileges or without um, being done by the individuals with the correct privileges or the necessary privileges. So that is fairly simple to understand with regards to the impact that SQL injection has on integrity. So just as it may it may be possible to read sensitive information, it is also possible to make changes or even delete this information with a SQL injection attack, therefore in uh, therefore affecting the integrity of the data, right? Because once a company has its w- website breached and it's a direct result of a SQL injection attack and individuals find out that attackers have gained access to the database, customers of that website will never trust the database or the integrity of the database because no one knows what the attackers did, whether they modified data. If they did modify it, what was the extent of the modification? The point I'm trying to pass along is that you can never trust that database. If a computer is hacked or is targeted by an attacker or an APT group and ransomware was deployed, you cannot clean it and you know fix it and decrypt the files and perform an antivirus scan and then proceed on with your life like nothing happened the integrity of the operating system has been affected and therefore it needs to be reinstalled so that makes sense now of course authentication is not really a pillar of the cia tried but I added it here with regards to how it uh how SQL injection attacks can affect authentication i've already gone through that so i'll skip over that but with regards to availability What does availability mean in the context of the CIA triad? It essentially means that data or a a system or an asset should be available to the individuals that have access to it or that should have uh, the, it should be available to users that should have access to it at almost 100% availability. So in the case of SQL injection, uh, SQL injection attacks can affect the availability of a web application and the database and could take the website down due to the loss or damage of the data. So you think of a large company like LinkedIn or you know Ashley Madison with the example I've given you, a breach of the database can lead to issues with the functionality of the web application because certain data that could be deleted that the web application needs to work correctly, therefore leading to a loss of service and therefore customers cannot use the service and availability is impacted, which can lead to financial loss, a loss of customers, so on and so forth. So the point I'm trying to make here with regards to the cybersecurity impact is that it's extremely severe because it affects the three primary pillars of the CIA triad, that being confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, of course, with regards to its consequences, these are fairly simple to understand, uh, given that we've already taken a look at uh, the vulnerabilities impact on the CIA triad. You know, SQL injection uh, consequences are obviously sensitive data exposure or data breaches, where SQL injection attacks can result in unauthorized access to sensitive data that is stored in a database. Attackers may be able to view or steal confidential information, such as customer data, financial information, and intellectual property. You then have data manipulation where attackers may be able to modify or delete data stored in a database, potentially causing data loss or corruption. Potential code execution. If a a database user has administrative privileges, an attacker can gain access to the target system using malicious code. That is specifically referring to database uh, user accounts and their access, uh, the access rights, because uh, you could potentially, if you have access to the to the database as the root user account, you could be able to break out of that and get the uh, the database management system to execute system code on the underlying server, regardless of whether it's Windows or Linux, and gain shell or gain a shell or remote code execution on the actual underlying server. Uh, 
And then, of course, business disruption, which is fairly self-explanatory. Successful SQL injection attacks can lead to and usually lead to business disruption as organizations work to identify the cause of the breach and then work on restoring services and, you know, preventing further attacks if it is more of a, you know, more of a targeted attack. So you sort of get the idea. It's a uh, SQL injection vulnerability is bad news if you're running an organization and you should always be, you know, uh, be up to date with regards to making sure that your web applications are secure and uh, the underlying infrastructure with regards to the database management system is set up correctly with security in mind. And that brings us to the risks of the SQL injection vulnerability or injection vulnerabilities in general. And this is where I'm going to be switching over to my browser and taking a look at the OASP top 10 to show you how the OASP project classifies SQL injection or injection vulnerabilities uh, from the perspective of the risks posed to an organization. So I'll see you there. All right, so I'm back uh, within my browser here and you can perform a quick Google search for the OASP top 10. If you're not familiar with it, let me introduce you to it very briefly. OASP Top 10 is a standard awareness document for developers and web application security. It, re it re represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. So the OASP Foundation works to improve security th uh, of software through its community-led open source software projects, hundreds of, of chapters worldwide, tens of thousands of members, and by hosting local and global conferences. So it is a project that seems to classify uh, security risks that affect web applications um, worldwide uh, each year and they usually have releases a top 10 list of vulnerabilities or web application security risks as it, as it says here and um, the most recent release that is actually currently being developed and worked on actively is 2021 so you can see they're sorted uh, we have 10 security risks here classified by their type so at the top in 2017 we had injection which is uh, referring to injection vulnerabilities and SQL injection falls under injection vulnerabilities. We had broken authentication vulnerabilities, sensitive data exposure, etc. And this diagram sort of shows us the change in 2021 or how the threat surface or threat landscape changed uh, or has been changing, whereby you can see in 2021 injection was a was number three in terms of severity or risk. And you have a description of each of these um, each of these vulnerabilities. So you can take a look at the latest one, which is the OASP Top 10 2021. However, if we take a look at OASP Top 10 2017, there's a PDF here. So you can see OASP Top 10 2017, the 10 most critical web application security risks. Why I'm going through this is to highlight a few things tied to the risk of the vulnerability, uh, the easiness of exploitation and identification, etc. So within this document, what typically happens or what OASP will typically do is give you a risk matrix here that they utilize to identify the exploitability of the vulnerability, the weakness prevalence, the we the weakness detectability, and the technical impacts, and as well as the business impacts, right? So this matrix is fairly simple to understand. Uh, it's color coded, so we have difficult, average, and easy. Where difficult, uh, with a value of one, is uh, yellow. Uh, average, or the the actual um, value of two, is um, is going to be orange, and then uh, the highest, which is three is red and that represents easy widespread easy or severe with regards to exploitability weakness prevalence weakness detectability and technical impacts the way this works is that there's a score of one to three one being the lowest in terms of exploitability weakness prevalence weakness detectability and technical impacts and three being the highest in the aforementioned that being these factors right over here as well as business impacts but those are business specific so the point is that for all of the vulnerabilities listed in the top 10 list there will be a matrix that sort of gives us the score with regards to exploitability weakness prevalence weakness detectability technical impacts as well as uh, the business impact so that, that is something that needs to be calculated uh, based on the specific type of business in question. So 
you can see the top 10 security risks are listed here where we have A1, which is injection. And this refers to injection flaws such as SQL, NoSQL, operating system or OS com uh, command injection and LDAP injection. These types of vulnerabilities occur when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter as part of a command or query. In the case of SQL or NoSQL injection, the interpreter is going to be the database uh, or is going to be facilitated by the, the, the query language, in this case, the structured query language. So the crux of the vulnerability revolves around the fact that the attacker's hostile data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or accessing data without proper author authorization. So if we go to injection right over here, you're going to see three, uh, three columns. You're going to have attack vectors, which refer to the exploitability of the vulnerability, uh, the security weaknesses where you have the prevalence and detectability of the vulnerability and the impacts uh, only technical being displayed. So with regards to the attack vectors and the exploitability, that has a score of three. And if we refer back here, you can see with regards to exploitability, the value of the, a, a score of three refers to the fact that it's very easy to exploit this vulnerability. And that's what OASP is telling us here. So almost any source of data can be an injection vector, environment variables, parameters, external and internal web services, and all types of users. Injection flaws occur when an attacker can send hostile data into an interpreter. So you can see that it's very easy to exploit. And this is not me saying it, this is OASP saying it. And this is what the community says. In terms of security weaknesses, the prevalence has a score of two, referring back. You can see the weakness prevalence is set uh, at two, which means it's very common, as well the, as the, de the detectability, which is set to three, which means with regards to the, de the detectability of the vulnerability, it's very easy to detect, as you already uh, can see here. And that takes us to the technical impacts, uh, which is set to three. And if we refer back, that is severe. So the technical impacts are obviously going to be severe. And also, I would assume that the business impacts will also be severe. So in terms of uh, the prevalence and detectability, as it says here, injection flaws are very, very, very prevalent, particularly in legacy code. Injection vulnerabilities are often found in SQL, LDAP, XPath, or NoSQL queries. Operating system commands, XML parsers, SMTP headers, expression languages, and ORM queries. Injection flaws are easy to discover when examining code. Scanners and fuzzers can help attackers find injection flaws. And we'll be taking a look at how to find injection vulnerabilities both manually and automatically. Uh, with regards to the technical impacts of the vulnerability, injection can result in data loss, corruption, or disclosure to unauthorized parties, loss of accountability. Again, coming back to the um, confidentiality, integrity, and availability um, side of uh, the CIA triad, denial of access, etc. Injection can sometimes lead to almost complete host takeover and the business impact depends on the needs of the application and data. The OASP top 10 document also goes over how you can perform checks to see if an application is vulnerable and how you can go about preventing SQL injection attacks or vulnerabilities and then some example attack scenarios where uh, some SQL queries have been provided uh, to you know extract a certain piece of information or to bypass a login. And you can take a look at their references here, as well as external references to the vulnerability or various injection vulnerabilities. The point I'm trying to make here, or the reason I, I wanted to cover this is to show you or to back up my claims that it's very easy or very straightforward to exploit. They're very prevalent in the wild or they're actually quite common. And Detecting them is very easy. And of course, their technical and business impacts are severe or high, to say the least. So this is a very, very, very big vulnerability uh, from the perspective of an attacker and even bigger from the perspective of a developer. This is something that you really need to prevent against or that you really need to work to or essentially work on if you are a web developer or you need to study up on. And uh, you know, hopefully this course will will cover a lot of that because we will be covering how we can uh, detect this uh, a SQL injection vulnerability in some PHP code towards the latter uh, stage or phase of this course. With that being said, uh, that's going to be it for the practical demonstration side. I'm going to switch back over to the slides. All right, so that brings us to the end of the introductory video where we took a look or we got an introduction, a formal introduction to SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, what causes them, a brief history of the vulnerability, as well as the data breaches, 
that were um, that occurred as a direct result of SQL injection vulnerabilities. We also touched upon the potential impacts uh, of the vulnerability, uh, the consequences, and uh, obviously the risks of the vulnerability. So we've covered quite a lot. We should now have a solid base, uh, solid foundational knowledge of the vulnerability uh, that will set the stage for what we'll be doing next or what we'll be covering next. So. In the next video, we're going to be taking a look at an anatomy of a SQL injection attack to sort of give you an idea as to what happens in the background or what the attack flow is from the perspective of an attack. And this will also be useful for defenders because you'll be able to identify where you need to focus on. And obviously that's fairly simple uh, to understand, mainly the web application and input or sanitizing user input. However, that's getting ahead of myself. So that's going to be it for this video and I'll be seeing you in the next video. The anatomy of an SQL injection attack. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at what an SQL injection attack looks like at a very high level using a diagram. Now, this was a video that I really wasn't intending to cover, but I think it's very important that you get this high level overview of what's going on before we actually get started with anything practical. And you'll soon understand why. Uh, and, you know, this one of the second reasons, although not as important, was primarily because after this video I was going to introduce you to the types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and how they work. But obviously it's very important that you understand at a very basic level what happens at a, at a high level first before we take a look at the types. So you can actually understand the differences between the types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and their respective nuances. So this is going to be a very simple video, but very, very, very important because it sort of outlines the three main components of the attack from an infrastructure perspective, as well as what goes on in the background, right? Because I think that's the key thing to understand. So as you can see, we have an attacker. That's going to be you. This could be a pen tester. Again, don't pay any attention to the legitimacy or the uh, the efficacy of uh, of the diagram and whether I'm referring to the attacker in a in a more malicious sense. You can you know it can just be as well be a penetration tester or a bug bounty hunter and uh, you find a web application that you want to test or that you have been contracted to test, uh, you've been contracted to test, and you connect to the website or the web application using the internet, right? So when you talk about a web application, specifically a database-driven web application or website, it usually consists of more than one element, right? And that's why I've sort of annotated it or segmented it uh, with using this, uh, this little box here that sort of acts as a you know as a border and shows you uh, all the elements within a web application or all the elements that make up a web application. The reason I did that is to sort of show you that we have a web server, right? Now, what is a web server? A web server is referring to the web server technology or the server that is hosting the web application itself. All right, and uh, the web server technology I could be referring to here is uh, you know either going to be Apache. Uh, Microsoft IIS, Nginx, et cetera. You know, the technology that hosts the web application. And then on the web server, uh, in conjunction with the web server technology, you're also going to have the server-side programming language. So when you talk about a more complex web application, you have the front end or the, you know, the actual front end of the website that is what is processed by the uh, the actual attackers or your user's browser that is, you know typically consists uh, consists of the uh, of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. That is what is rendered on the uh, on the user's web page or within their browser. And then for any additional functionality like authentication, that is handled by a server side programming language. In this case, PHP is the example I'm going to be using. It could be .NET, it could be anything else, all right? But that's typically what we have. And let's say this web application, uh, let's say in this case, it's WordPress. It's a WordPress site, all right? WordPress is running on Apache. The web server is Linux, and the server-side programming language is obviously going to be PHP. The database being used is MySQL. And this is typically referred to as a web application stack, all right? In this case, the stack would be LAMP. LAMP is an abbreviation for Linux being the underlying operating system or kernel. 
that is running on the, the actual server, the bare metal server or the server in the cloud. Apache being the web server technology, M for MySQL referring to the, the actual database being used. Typically, you could see this interchanged with a database management system like MySQL or MariaDB or even PostgreSQL, but typically MySQL or MariaDB. And the P in LAMP refers to the server-side programming language, which is PHP. All right, so you connect to the website. It could be a blog. In, in the case of WordPress, it typically is. Uh, and you can also log in on a WordPress site. So let's use that as an example. So the attacker or you as the pen tester finds this WordPress login page or the login form uh, on the web application. And you obviously realize that this could be injectable in that there may not be input uh, validation. And secondly, this login form or this input is clearly interacting with the database in some way or form in that whatever data is sent here is going to be sent to the database for verification. In this case, a username or email and password combination. So what the attacker does is firstly identify the application input, in this case, the login form. Secondly, test to see whether there is any input validation. The test is obviously going to be putting in a SQL query. So this is where you have the specially crafted HTTP request where, and I'll talk about the different types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and where you can inject the SQL query because within the request, you can put it as a parameter within the URL. It could also be part of the body of the HTTP request where you have the username parameter and the password parameter that could also be passed along in the URL. It really doesn't matter. We create a specially crafted HTTP request that contains the SQL query to do whatever you want it to do. You could choose to dump uh, the, uh, you could choose to dump the contents of a particular table. You could be verifying whether the vulnerability exists by trying to perform a error-based SQL injection, where you try and get the database to throw back an error, therefore verifying that the SQL query was injected and executed successfully. It really doesn't matter. You create that, you create and inject or send that specially crafted HTTP request with that SQL query injected. If the web application doesn't have any input validation, that gets sent to the back end of the web application running on the web server, which in this case is PHP. So PHP says, okay, it looks like a user is trying to log in here because the request came from the page login or WordPress login.php. All right, so it takes a look at the data. It can see that it's been, it's been sent correctly. However, what it doesn't check if there isn't any validation is the value of the username field. The web application will typically expect that a simple string for the user or the email will be sent, but it doesn't check this. In this case, what's happened is we've injected a SQL query as part of the value of the username parameter. So we're essentially sending over a piece of code that will be executed by the database. So coming back to WordPress and the backend, so WordPress says, okay, this is coming from the login page. Uh, the username and password have been specified. Their values have been specified, but we don't know whether the values are malicious or legitimate. So WordPress knows what to do. It needs to send this data to the database for verification. Now, the key thing I want you to focus on here is the communication between the web server or the back end of the web application and the database, all right? In order for this communication to happen, there needs to be some form of, authentic of authentication. And this is where database management systems or relational database management systems come into play in the case of SQL databases. Whenever you're setting up a database, in order to interact with it, you need to have username and password. So when you set up a MySQL database, the default user account is going to be root. Now, most developers know to create another user account with specific privileges in order to, you know, in order to avoid using the root account to run commands or execute uh, SQL queries, right? So in order for this to work, WordPress needs to be configured to have the authentication credentials required to interact and authenticate with the database in order to run checks, like checking to see if a, user, if a user account exists and then logging them in. The point I'm trying to make is the communication between the web server or the back end of the web application and the database is always authenticated. Now, the great thing from an attacker's perspective is we don't have to target this authentication. We're simply leveraging the web application's access or the credentials that the web application has 
to we are using that access to authenticate to the database without knowing the credentials and getting our SQL query executed and then getting that data responded or returned back to us depending on the type of SQL ejection vulnerability. So going back again to the example, we log in, we inject the SQL query into the username field. WordPress says, okay, data has been submitted. We need to send this to the database for verification to see if this user exists. The way the web application or the back end of the web application interacts with the database is through the structured query language. So in this case, WordPress is going to send a query saying, from this table, can you check if this user exists? Now, when it specifies the user, it's going to specify that SQL query that you specify. And the way you design it is to operate as a second query so that when this is executed by the database, I mean, the database receives the original query and says, okay, I know what to do with this. And it says, okay, so select from this table. And then there seems to be a comment inferring, or there seems to be a, uh, a line denominator inferring that a second query is to be specified and says, okay, uh, select from this. And then there's a, you know, there's a delimiter. And then the, the query after that is the one that we injected, right? And then it says, okay, uh, second query, let's inject this uh, or let's execute this. And the database does what it's been asked to do by, in this case, WordPress. And then the database responds with what the web application has asked. In this case, it's typically going to be a Boolean response, either true or false, or could respond with any other you know, form of data that is then sent back to the web uh, to the web application or the backend, in this case, being WordPress. And WordPress says, okay, uh, depending on the query that was sent, this user exists. If it does, it logs the user in. If it doesn't, it responds with not valid a username or not valid password. In the case of this SQL injection example, what we've done with that query we injected is we've bypassed the login. Again, this is an example. We've bypassed the login. So the response would just be true, right? Or something like that sent back by the database and you know that logs us in. If it's an error-based SQL injection uh, payload that we send uh, or that we inject, what will happen is the database, the MySQL database will execute it. And uh, in this case, we could be trying to identify the version of the database being used and date, that data will be sent back. And the web application, if it's, as I said, if it's in-band and error-based, will display it on that page where you performed the injections. So it'll actually be displayed on that page as a piece of text. Now, how it's rendered is entirely up to the web application and how it's designed. And this is what we'll be exploring when we'll be talking about in-band SQL injection attacks, more specifically uh, error-based SQL injection attacks. So as you can see, it's very simple to understand what's going on. And the key thing that I want you to focus on here is the fact that once you've identified the injection point, and you've validated that you can, in fact, send in SQL queries and they are being executed by the database, it really doesn't matter what SQL query or payload you use because that's all down to the purpose of the attacker. If you're a pen tester, you're never going to do anything dangerous with your SQL payload. You'll typically run test payloads that will confirm that a SQL injection vulnerability exists in that they are not reading any sensitive data or they're not deleting data or anything like that. Because remember, as a pen tester or an ethical hacker or bug bounty hunter, your job is to provide a proof of concept and not do anything illegal or malicious, especially when you're talking about databases. So the payload really does not matter. You will, of course, modify the payload depending on the type of SQL injection attack. For example, if it's time-based, then you'd use a SQL query that utilizes uh, time-based parameters to, uh, to essentially tell the database to execute this after 10 seconds or after 30 seconds, etc. But the objective of the payload um, doesn't really matter. If you're a, a malicious attacker, obviously that will mean that you're using more dangerous SQL queries or SQL uh, payloads. And again, I'll refer to these two interchangeably. I usually call them queries or payloads. I'm simply referring to what is injected regardless of whether it is dangerous or legitimate, because you could be injecting something that is not dangerous, right? Like a query that asks for the version or asks the database to display its uh, database schema or something like that. So that's the first thing I want you to pay attention to. The second thing I want you to pay attention to is the payload you will use. So let's say you're a malicious attacker and you're trying to delete data from the database. Now, 
if the web application and the database have been configured securely in that the user account that has been configured for the web application to authenticate to the database with is a low privileged user that can only read data but not delete data, then that SQL query that you send or inject will not work because the user credentials or the user account used for this authentication uh, does not have the privileges to do that. So that's something that you need to be aware of because you could have successful SQL injection where you're able to read data, dump data, etc. And then you may run a SQL, uh, you may try and inject a SQL query that uh, where you're asking the database to delete a particular row or to delete a particular table and you find out that you don't get any response or you get an error saying you can do that. That's because you don't have or the credentials configured for the authentication between the web server or the backend of the web application and the database uh, belong to a user account that does not have the privileges necessary or required in order to do that. So the key thing to note is as a pen tester, as a legitimate ethical hacker, pen tester, bug bounty hunter, your job is never to use a dangerous SQL payload or SQL query. Your first job is to identify an input, which is fairly easy. Secondly, test for input validation, bypass filters if you can, and then determine the type of SQL injection vulnerability that affects the web application, whether it's error-based, whether you need to use a union-based attack, or whether you need to use time-based or uh, um, time-based or boolean-based SQL injection. Once you've done that, you uh, essentially uh, generate a proof of concept where you show that indeed this uh, this web application is indeed vulnerable to SQL injection. You specify the you know you provide proof of concept uh, and how you can how the developer or the company can go about recreating it. And that's pretty much it. So the point I'm making is that um, with regards to the process, it's very simple. As long as you understand this process and how web applications are set up and the components that make up the web application, you're pretty much good to go from a theoretical perspective. Now, of course, performing the tests manually require a lot of trial and error. This is where automated tools come into play, but we'll be taking a look at all of this. I just wanted to give you this, you know, brief foray uh, or, you know, uh, intro as to what the attack looks like from a process perspective or a methodology perspective. So hopefully this improves your understanding as to what goes on in the background. As I said, don't pay any attention to the payload that is executed. That is rarely consequential, especially if, you, if you're aware of what queries to use when and when to use them. Uh, with that being said, hopefully this was valuable to you. We're now going to, uh, to turn our attention to the individual uh, SQL injection vulnerability types, or rather we'll be turning our attention to the types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and their subtypes. And you may be a little bit confused as to what you mean by subtypes, but don't worry about that. That's what I'll be explaining. So uh, with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. Types of SQL injection vulnerabilities. Now, this is a video or a topic or a section of this course that is uh, quite close to my heart. The reason I say that is because I wish someone would have explained this to me uh, before I got started with SQL injection vulnerabilities. It would have saved me a lot of time conceptually and mentally to picture the differences between the various types and subtypes of SQL injection vulnerabilities. Now, if you're asking yourself, there are types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and subtypes, and uh, this is a bit confusing. I thought SQL injection vulnerability was a type of vulnerability in and of itself. Well, that's true. However, SQL injection, as you'll see, consists of multiple types of SQL injection vulnerabilities as well as subtypes that are used or that uh, exist because of their means of exploitation or the way they're exploited as well as how the web application is configured. So I don't want to explain too much before we actually get into this, but I'm going to be breaking everything down. So if this is not, you're not familiar with this, or if you are a pen tester or a bug bounty hunter and you have somewhat of a basic understanding of this, don't worry, uh, hold on to your horses. Let me uh, introduce you to this the correct way. So 
This particular table is something I'm particularly proud of because you can go ahead and search anywhere online and you may find something similar to this, but really this is the correct way of looking at SQL injection vulnerabilities with regards to their, to their types and subtypes. So as you can see, we have the main uh, vulnerability here, which is SQL injection. Now SQL injection is, ma is made up of three primary types, all right? And those are in-band SQL injection, which I meant, which I mentioned in the in the introduction. We then have blind SQL injection and out-of-band SQL injection. In-band and blind being the most common and most popular of the three. Out-of-band is also, uh, I would say, fairly popular but very difficult to orchestrate. So in this course, we'll be touching upon in-band and blind and also that applies to their subtypes will be covering error-based, union-based, boolean-based, and time-based, each in their own video or their own section. Now, why do we have this categorization of the vulnerability into types or subtypes? Well, the reason we have them is firstly by virtue of how they work and how they work, how they're exploited, and how this, you know, how they essentially tie into the functionality of the web application and the database being used or the configuration of the database with regards to what queries you're allowed to execute as well as how data is returned back uh, from the database and then you know how it's responded back to the user by the web application itself. So we'll return back to this table at the end of this video, but let's get started with the first type which is in-band, all right? So what is in-band SQL injection or SQL injection? In-band SQL injection is the most common type of SQL injection attack or vulnerability. It occurs when an attacker uses the same communication channel to send an, the attack or the SQL payload and to receive the results. Now, what does this mean? You may have been thinking to yourself, that, hey, whenever I inject a payload, a SQL injection payload, I expect to get some data back and I expect to, to get it back from the web application itself. Well, yes, uh, in most cases you do. And that this is what you typically call an in-band SQL injection vulnerability, where you inject an SQL payload through whatever application input that gets processed by the web application and then by the database and then the database re returns data based on the query you injected and that data is then displayed by the web application itself somewhere on the page depending on how it's developed right so that is in band the the key thing to note here is that the attacker uses the same communication channel. When I refer to the communication channel, I'm referring to the web application. In most cases, it's going to be the web application being the single communication channel. When I say communication channel, I'm referring to what we're using to communicate with the database, all right? So in this case, the same communication channel is going to be the web application. So in other words, or simply put, with in-band SQL injection, the attacker injects malicious or legitimate SQL code or query into the web application and then receives the results of the attack or from the database through the same channel used to submit the code. In this case, in most cases, the web application itself. So let's say you have a login form uh, or you have a, a search bar or any input point on a web application, you inject a SQL uh, query or payload that uh, will essentially try and enumerate the database or the version of MySQL running. What happens with in-band, and this is how you identify that it is an in-band SQL injection vulnerability, is that the response or the version, if it is successful, will be displayed on that same page. So it'll actually be rendered by the web application. So it'll tell you, it may give you an error, but it will have that info displayed on that same page of injection or the same communication channel. So when I say communication channel, just think of it as the web application, which in the, in most cases it is. So. Coming to the third point here, in-band SQL injection attacks are extremely dangerous because they can be used to steal sensitive information, modify or delete data, or take over the entire web, web application or even the entire server. Now, this can be done with the other types of SQL injection vulnerabilities, but what makes in-band so dangerous is primarily the fact that you get the data that you're looking for. If you're trying to dump the database, it's going to be returned to you almost immediately on that same page. So that means you don't even need to use a tool like SQL map that will actually try and get it for you using different techniques with in-band, specifically when you're doing error-based or union-based, 
you'll get exactly what you're looking for or even confirmation of successful execution of a SQL query on that same web page or the same page where you performed the injection if you're targeting a web application that is so very 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 dangerous now this diagram is sort of uh, one that was built on the, the one i highlighted in the anatomy of a sql injection attack video but it's essentially the same concept here where we have an attacker the web application which consists of the web server and the database and of course i, I went over the fact that um the web server and the database communicate uh and I essentially have authentication first and then they can communicate and uh, you know send and receive data uh, but it's essentially the same diagram for all intents and purposes the only thing i modified is what is being sent in the http request and we'll talk about the various ways you can inject a sql query but not right now in this case the example is we've injected a sql query uh, that uh, asks the web application and consequently the database to list user accounts from a particular table, right? The point I'm trying to make here is this is all a single communication channel in that the input or the injection and the output and the results are all facilitated through the web application itself. I know that in this case, the arrows are pointing to the web server, but realistically that's where it's coming from. So all single communication channels. So we say list user accounts or use an SQL query that asks that, that gets processed by the, uh, or injected because there's no input validation. The web application sends it as a SQL query. The database processes the data, sends back the data, and the web application receives the data and then renders it on that same page where you performed the, the actual injection. And you get the result like this, where the user accounts are admin, John, Mike, etc. So very, very, very powerful and very common, as you'll see with the various uh, uh, labs that we'll be going through. So what are the subtypes, the in-band SQL injection subtypes? How, uh, what techniques can you utilize to perform uh, an in-band SQL injection attack? Well, the, the two subtypes are error-based and union-based. So by the way, we'll be exploring each of these in their own video, so don't worry if the description is fairly short. I just want to introduce you to them. When you, when you speak of error-based SQL injection, in error-based SQL injection attacks, the attacker injects SQL code, and this is very important. The SQL code here is very important. So the attacker injects SQL code that causes the web application to generate an error message based on the query that was specified. So the error message can contain valuable information about the database schema or the contents of the database itself, which makes, uh, which the attacker can then use to further exploit the vulnerability. So what you're doing with error-based is you're firstly using it as a way to verify whether there is in fact an in-band SQL injection vulnerability that exists on the web application. So you'll typically use an SQL payload that when executed by the web application or and consequently the database will generate an error, typically by the web application itself, telling you that whatever you've specified, whatever data you've input is incorrect. And you know you could have specified a query that dis asks that, that essentially uh, requests or will display the version of the database being used. That will also be displayed on that same page where you made the injection because it is an in-band uh, SQL injection subtype or it falls under in-band SQL injection. You then have union-based, and this is very simple to understand. Once you understand SQL queries and how SQL works at a basic level, which we'll take a look at, this is very easy to understand. So with union-based SQL injection, the attacker uses the union operator to combine two SQL queries, or rather the results of two or more SQL queries into a single result set. By manipulating the injected SQL code, the attacker can extract data from the database that they're not authorized to access. So you're essentially just uh, combining two queries together or using the predefined query that the web application sends and then appending another query to that, um, to, to, to that original value of a particular parameter and saying, uh, okay, Mr. Database, can you also execute this second query as well? And you do that by using the union operator. And again, don't worry if this sounds a little bit confusing, it will make sense, trust me, when we take a look at practical examples, and more specifically, when we take a look at the, uh, the fundamentals of SQL or the structured query language. So I've used another diagram here to illustrate how error-based SQL injection works. So 
Uh, with error in this particular example, during an error-based SQL injection attack, the penetration tester tries to force the database management system, just think of the database management system as the database, to output an error message. And once they have that error message, that error message gives them confirmation that yes, this site is affected by an in-band SQL injection vulnerability, more so error-based. They then use that information to do additional stuff like listing out the, the contents of a particular table, viewing data or dumping the entire database, etc. So very, very simple to understand because it's in-band, we're using the same communication channel, in this case, the web application in that the injection point and where we get the results from the database are all coming through the same single point or the same communication channel in this case. And in most cases, that will always be the web application itself. So. You can see step one, we inject the SQL uh, payload. It can be anything. In this case, we're asking it to do something that will generate an error. And it does indeed do that because it's successfully executed by the database and the web application knows that this is an error. So it also outputs that. And you know that tells you, yes, okay, this, uh, this web application does not have any input validation. And whatever we specified for the SQL payload, the SQL query itself, has been executed successfully. That's why we're getting the error because it was indeed erroneous. So that's how that works. Now, the second type is of course, blind SQL injection. Now this is uh, again, also quite common, but the way it works is uh, very, very different. And you may have a lot of questions after this one and I don't, um, I'm not surprised by that. So blind, as the name suggests, blind SQL injection is a type of SQL injection attack where an attacker can exploit a vulnerability or, you know, exploits a SQL injection vulnerability in a web application that does not directly reveal information about the database or does, does not send back the results from the database based on the injected SQL query or what you specified in the, uh, or what SQL query you used. So what does that mean? It means that in contrast to the in-band SQL injection attacks, you're still using the same communication channel. However, in this one, this vulnerability, for some reason, depending on how the web application was designed or the type of query you're executing, the web application does not respond or does not display the results of, your, of the SQL query that you injected. So. This one is very, very confusing to understand because you may then be asking yourself, well, what if the injection is possible and my query is being executed, but I'm not getting anything to validate it? How can I validate that this is in fact working or th there is a SQL injection vulnerability that exists here, regardless of whether I'm getting data back? And I'll get to that shortly. So in this type of attack, the attacker injects malicious SQL code or queries or a payload, whatever you want to call it, into the application's input field, but the application does not return any useful information or error message to the attacker in the response. So you really don't know what's going on. And no pun intended, you are fundamentally blind as to whether your payload is working, which is where it gets its name from. So how do you know whether it's working? Well, the, atta the attacker will typically utilize various techniques to infer information about the database, such as time delays or Boolean logic. What does this mean? Well, the attacker may inject SQL code or a SQL query that causes the application or the database rather to delay for a specified amount of time, depending on the result of a query. All right. So I'll get into how this can be done, but this is where the two subtypes come into play, the two blind SQL injection subtypes, where we have Boolean-based SQL injection and time-based SQL injection. So when you speak of Boolean-based SQL injection, in this type of attack, the attacker exploits an application's response to Boolean conditions to infer information about the database. So the attacker sends a malicious SQL query to the application and evaluates the response on whether the query executed successfully or failed. So you're using Boolean based SQL queries. So SQL queries that essentially ask the database to do something and the response is, all, is always going to be either true or false or a Boolean response. And that tells you whether what you've injected was executed successfully. Fairly simple to understand. Uh, we'll, we'll dive deeper into this because there's a bit more nuance to it. And then with time-based blind injection, this is one of my favorites. Uh, in this type of attack, the attacker exploits the application's response time to infer information about the database. 
So the attacker sends a malicious SQL query or a standard SQL query that has time parameters, essentially telling the application or the database to execute this after a certain amount of time. And then if the application does that or uh, essentially returns a response within that specified amount of time or after that specified amount of time, you know that the injection was successful uh, just because it obeyed your instructions with regards to time parameters. So you're not relying on output from the database, rather the actual uh, time taken by the database or the web application to execute that SQL query. So essentially measuring the time to see whether your the injection was successful or not. Um, and touching upon one example of blind SQL injection, more specifically Boolean based uh, SQL injection, we're using the same diagram here where an attacker might send a query that asks whether a particular username exists in the database and the application's response will either be true or false. By asking a series of questions and, anal and analyzing the responses, the attacker can slowly build up a picture of the database schema and the content. So a Boolean based SQL injection is can be very difficult to do or is a very nuanced technique, but as I said, we'll be breaking it down. So in this case, very, very simple example, um, we're asking a question using a SQL query like, does the user John exist, right? Very random piece of data. And then based on the response, we're able to say, okay, this exists. So maybe there, you know, maybe there is a, a table called users or usernames. If it doesn't respond correctly, we know, okay, we need to try something else. So let's try and see whether a table called um, WordPress users exists. If it does, then we say, okay, does the user admin exist? the web application responds with true. So we know that this user exists. Okay, so we now know a lot about the database and you build up your knowledge of the database and then dump data from the database using this technique. And uh, that brings us to the third type, which we'll not be covering, but I'll explain it nonetheless. And that is out, out of band SQL injection, right? Out of band is a small variation on what we've just taken a look at with in band and blind. The only difference is the, res the response or the return of data. So out of band SQL injection is the least common type of SQL injection attack and involves an attack exploiting a vulnerability in a web application to extract data from a database using a different communication channel other than the web application itself. Unlike in-band SQL injection, where the attacker can observe the result of the, uh, the injected SQL query in the application's response, out-of-band SQL injection does not require the attacker to receive any response from the application. So we're not relying on the response from the database being displayed or being sent back by the web application. We're now using an alternate communication channel. So as you can tell, you might be asking yourself, well, where is this data being sent? Well, the attacker can leverage various techniques to extract data from the database, such as sending HTTP requests to an external server controlled by the attacker or using DNS queries to extract data. All right, so this is what an out-of-band SQL injection attack looks like. So an out-of-band attack is classified by having two different communication channels, one to launch the attack or one where you inject the actual payload and the other to gather the results based on the query you specified or the query that was, inje uh, that was injected. For example, the attack channel could be a web request or an injection in the app web application input and the data gathering channel could, could be monitoring HTTP or DNS request made to a service you control. So this involves using an SQLI payload that will not just uh, execute a query to dump data, but one, and this is where the database management system specific uh, functionality or understanding what database is running will uh, becomes very useful because you could execute or inject a SQL payload that re requests for data and then tells the database to send it. We remember we're asking the database itself to send it to another uh, web server or another endpoint that we control. And that's where we receive the results of the injection. So we inject the SQL payload into the, an input point on the web application. It knows what to do with it. It sends an SQL query to the database. The database sees the SQL query and it, it looks valid and it says, okay, it's asking me to dump this uh, the data from this table and to send it and database can uh, databases can do this. Uh, you want the web application wants me to send it to another endpoint. All right, so I'll do that. It executes the SQL query and sends it to another endpoint and that's the endpoint we control and we receive the the responses or the results of our of the execution of the SQL query or the SQL payload that we injected. 
So these are the three types and uh, the four subtypes of the various SQL injection vulnerabilities that exist. And I'll just go back to the table because I think that's quite important just to summarize where we are. As I said, we'll be focusing on two main types and uh, the four subtypes where we'll take a look at in-band SQL injection and blind. We'll not be covering out of band because it's just a small variation and it's very hard to orchestrate. But uh, within in-band, we'll be taking a look at um, error-based SQL injection, union-based SQL injection, and then within blind SQL injection, we'll take a look at Boolean-based SQL injection and time-based SQL injection. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video. Now that we have an understanding or you've got an introduction to SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities, you've taken a look at a basic anatomy of what a SQL injection attack looks like, and you're familiar with the various types and subtypes of SQL injection vulnerabilities, we can now turn our attention to the building blocks or the most important components that make up the attack from a technical perspective, and that is databases themselves, more specifically databases and database management systems, uh, as well as relational databases and NoSQL databases and the differences between the two. And then we'll also turn our attention to, C, uh, to SQL or the structured query language, how to write uh, SQL code or SQL queries, how to do various things with SQL so you understand how to, you know, what payloads to use. And uh, that will uh, essentially take us to the conclusion of the intro section of this course. We'll then turn our attention to the actual practical stuff we will be you know, identifying and exploiting these various uh, types of SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, with that being said, that's going to be it for this video, and I will be seeing you in the next video. Introduction to Databases and Database Management Systems. In this video, I'm going to be giving you a formal introduction to databases, sort of explaining what they are and uh, why they're used or how they're used, as well as, you know, database management systems. I've sort of used that term a lot, but I haven't introduced you to it. And we'll, all, we'll also talk about the different types of databases that exist. And I'll also go over or, you know, just introduce you to SQL databases and, you know, what the differentiation is. The reason why I'm um, you know, why I've actually uh, created this video, or why I think this is important as a topic is because you're going to be working with databases. And I've mentioned a lot of terms and uh, types of databases or terms regarding databases, and uh, you may not be familiar with them. And I'm going to use uh, this video and the next video to demystify this so that you have a better understanding as to what they are, why they are used and how they operate uh, with regards to uh, their functionality and how they relate to one another. So getting started, what is a database? Well, a database is simply a collection of data that is organized in a way that makes it easy to manage, access and update. So keep uh, I want you to focus on those three terms, manage, access, and update. These are fundamental. So one of the, you know, the primary reasons you want a database is because you have a lot of data that is important to you and a database is used uh, or provides you with the ability to manage it, access it, and update that information in a very convenient way. So in computing terms, a database is typically managed by a database management system also known as DBMS. That's sort of the abbreviation there. What is a DBMS? A DBMS essentially provides you with a set of tools and interfaces to interact with the data. So it sort of uh, provides you with a standardized way of going about managing, accessing, and updating the data that's stored within your database. So a database is simply a way of organizing data, right? Or is a collection of data that can be stored in any database management system, depending on what your requirements are. And these, this is where the types of databases come into play. All right, so where are databases used? Database, uh, da databases are used in a variety of applications, including business applications, websites, and mobile applications to store and manage large amounts of structured or unstructured data. And you know some of it, uh, some examples of data that can be stored in a database include customer information, financial records, product inventory, and employee records. So whatever you you want to store in a database, uh, there's a database type that can be used depending on your requirements. And obviously, many uh, companies and even individuals 
use a database in one way or another. I can almost guarantee that you use at least five services, web applications or mobile applications that utilize some form of a database, uh, regardless of the type. What I'm trying to point out here is that they're very, very useful in technology uh, because uh, you know applications need a standardized way of, again, managing, accessing and updating data that is relevant to the uh, to the proper functionality of the application or their service or even their organization or company. So uh, sort of going uh, or diving a little bit deeper into database management systems, uh, DBMS as they're known, is essentially a software system that enables users to create, store, organize, manage, and retrieve data from a database. And DBMSs provide an interface between the user and the database, allowing users to interact with the database without having to understand the underlying technical details of data storage, retrieval, and management. So what a DBMS does is it makes it much more simpler and standardizes the process of again, accessing, um, creating, storing, organizing, and managing the data within the database. Now, why is this important? Well, imagine if uh, everyone had a database for, and they were using it for, you know, to store whatever data they, they had or whatever data they wanted stored. Imagine if, uh, you know, they could, or they essentially had to go about the process of again, um, managing, accessing, and updating the data manually. Uh, and you know, sort of interacting with the database at a very low level, it would become very difficult. With the database management system, this process becomes standardized and is uh, replicable across different organizations or different individuals. That means if I'm using a database, a relational database like uh, MySQL, and uh, MySQL utilizes the structured query language, it means that anyone that has used MySQL before or anyone that's familiar with the structured query language, even if they're coming from another uh, relational database management system like PostgreSQL, can still work with MySQL without having to learn anything new. Maybe a few uh, new things about the schema and the way MySQL operates, but you can sort of understand why this was created, why database management systems were created. They sort of act as that translation layer between you and the database and, you know, uh, allow you to do what you need to do uh, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So the key functionalities that they provide you with is the functionality to create, delete, and modify, and also query data that's stored in a database, and also manages important aspects uh, or elements of your data like security, concurrency control, backups, recovery, and other important aspects of data management. So they're very, very, very important pieces of software. And an example of a database management system, or correctly speaking, a relational database management system, as I've said, is something like MySQL, right? So that uh, brings us to the you know various database management systems these are more so relational database management systems but they are considered at a high level database management management systems uh, examples of these are mysql which is a free open source relational database management system and i'll explain what relational is but um, it's a relational database management system that is widely used primarily used by or for web applications PostgreSQL is another popular open source relational database management system that is known for its advanced features and reliability. Again, quite popular with web applications as well. We then have Oracle Database, which is a commercial relational database management system developed by Oracle uh, that is widely used in enterprise applications. And then we have, of course, Microsoft SQL Server. We're also known as MS SQL, which is a commercial relational database management system uh, that was, you know, developed for web applications or any applications that require a relational database, uh, you know, for the storage and, you know, retrieval of data. So that brings us to the types of databases because this is very important. So we know what a database is. We know what a database management system is. Now, what are the different types of databases available? Because the type of data you want, you may want to store. Uh, and the way you want to go about accessing it and updating it might be very different, right? Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is where the types come into play because the types will, uh, you will essentially use a specific type of database uh, depending on your requirements or use cases. So we have firstly relational databases, all right? So uh, a relational database is a database that organizes data into one or more tables or relations where each table represents an entity or a concept and the columns of the table represent 
um, the attributes of that entity or concept. So think of a table called um, students, right? So let's say we have a table called students and uh, within that particular table in a relational database, the columns would be student ID, student name, student um, student uh, date of birth uh, and any other attributes that you want. In that it sets, it allows you to utilize a system of organization. And I'll talk about the relational aspect in the next video, but it, it allows you, it's a very simple way of looking at things, but it, it allows you to easily reference specific data in that you can reference that student in another table. And this is where the word relational comes into play. So let's say we have that primary table where we have student info. And then uh, we have another um, we have another table called uh, let's say um, student classes, and uh, student classes has two columns: uh, class ID and class name. And then we have a third table called um, uh, student courses, right? And the point is that that third table uh, has a relationship between the student table and the course table in that it pulls data from them. The data that it pulls is firstly, it'll pull the student um, the student name in one column from the student table, and it'll then pull the, uh, the student, uh, so it'll then pull the course ID or the course name from the course uh, table, and it'll then reference that data and then, and then, you know, obviously that data can be called wherever it needs to be. The point is that relational databases essentially set up a system where you know, you have multiple sets of data uh, sorted out in different ways and you can you know, can pull data from different tables to come up with a uh, a new table that has specific type of data or related data that, you know, you can then make sense of or that you require your web application to use for whatever, you know, use case. You then have NoSQL databases. NoSQL databases are a type of database that do not use the traditional tabular relations used in relational databases. Instead, NoSQL databases use a variety of data models to store and access data. So they differ in terms of how they work in that they do, do not utilize the standard or traditional tabular relations that I've just mentioned with that example. And of course, we'll go, we'll take a look at the differences between the two in the next video, but for now, uh, just use these uh, definitions to give you an understanding as to how they work. Now, the advantages of relational and NoSQL databases are something that I'll not dive into in this particular course because it's beyond the scope. Uh, but we then have a third type, and there are many other types that you can perform research on, but these are the three primary types that you see implemented or deployed. We have object-oriented databases, and these are databases that store data as objects rather than in tables, allowing for more complex data stru uh, structures and relationships. So it's essentially just turning uh, data into an object, and then uh, data has spe uh, specific attributes, sort of like object-oriented programming, where uh, you know, you have a classes and functions and uh, they all have their own, you know, uh, their, old, their own data, you know, so on and so forth. I'm not going to dive too deep into that. They just differ uh, in terms of how, you know, how data is stored and how they can be referenced. I think that's the key differentiating factor between all three and, you know, the other types of databases. And that brings us to SQL databases, all right? So SQL databases are not a different type of database. They just refer to the means of interacting with a relational database typically. So SQL databases are relational databases that store data in tables with rows and columns and use the structured query language or SQL as their, st their standard language for managing data. What that means is that if you're using a SQL database like MySQL, in order for you to update a particular row or to create a new table, you need to utilize a SQL query or a structured query language query or just a SQL query uh, that allows you to do that. So this is where SQL injection comes into play, where you use a SQL query and inject it and then you know hopefully it gets injected by the database and then gives you data so we'll talk about the you know some important sql syntax that you need to be aware of and the way you can find payloads and all of that but for now just think of it as a, rela a relational database that utilizes sql um, as their standard language for managing data so they enforce strict data integrity rules and support transactions to ensure data consistency. And SQL databases are widely used in applications that require complex data queries 
and the ability to handle large amounts of structured data. Some examples of SQL databases include MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, and PostgreSQL. So why are SQL databases used? As this, uh, as the final point here infers, they're used, uh, they're used in cases where applications need to reference very specific data. So they're very useful for, you know, blogs or content management systems or advanced applications that want to pull very specific data from the database or from a particular table. And the way this is facilitated is not really by the relational nature of the database or the way it's set up, is really through SQL because the structured query language is very powerful. You can do a lot. And that's what actually causes the vulnerabilities. The fact that the structured queries language is so powerful if you can inject a structured query or an SQL query into the database for execution, you can get it to do a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, the, it has its advantages and its advantage, uh, disadvantages. And this is one of the disadvantages, the fact that it's vulnerable to SQL injection or the fact that it can execute even the most complex of uh, SQL queries that, you know, ask it to delete an entire table if it do, if the the communication or the user account used to interact between the web application and the database, the SQL database, um, is a privileged user account, then you can essentially write a SQL query to delete an entire table or to, you know, essentially dump the entire contents of a particular uh, table or multiple sets of tables. So, the you know, this is uh, extremely powerful. That's the, the underlying point that I want to make here. So, now that we have gotten an, uh, an understanding as to what databases are, how they work, what they used for the different types of databases and how they differ, we're now going to take a closer look at the differences between relational databases and NoSQL databases because th this, this is going to be very, very important, well, as, as, especially once we get started with the, the SQL injection, uh, the practical side of SQL injection, also at the latter phase of this course, when we'll be exploring no SQL injection, uh, this, the, the next video will be very, very important uh, in that. So uh, with that being said, that's going to be it uh, for this video, and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Relational databases versus NoSQL databases. In this video, we'll be diving slightly deeper into each of these uh, two types of uh, databases, which we got an introduction to in the previous video. And the key thing that I'll be highlighting in this particular video is really how they differ from one another, not with regards to uh, when they're deployed in you know what use cases, but really the the main difference being the fact that obviously relational databases specifically sql databases utilize you know the structured query language but also how the relational database system works with regards to you know uh querying data uh you know and essentially managing data and also touching on the same with regards to no sql databases so sort of covering how they store data in their own individual right therefore differentiating them from one another so Getting started, firstly, we're already familiar with the relational database, but just going through it again, a relational database is a type of database that organizes data into one or more tables or relations. So think of them, just think of different tables, all right? And the fact that uh, tables can pull data from other tables, therefore relating them or linking them to one another. So um, a relational database is a type of database that organizes data into one or more tables or relations where each table represents an entity or a concept and the columns of the table represent the attributes of that entity or concept. And I'll use an example here with a diagram that'll make it really easy to understand. The relations between the tables are established by the use of keys which link the records in one table to the records in another table. Again, pay attention to that. This is typically denoted uh, within relational databases, the, the actual keys are typically denoted by an ID or an identifier. All right, so relational databases use a structured query language or use the structured query, uh, query language to manage the data or, you know, access the data or reference the data, etc. 
and this SQL or the, struct uh, the structured query languages we'll be taking a look at in the next video is a standardized language that is used to create, manipulate, and query relational databases. So that's the link. Uh, and this is where we have the RDBMS, right? So we talked about the database management system, and now we have the relational database management system, which is what they should be called when you're dealing with relational uh, databases. So RDBMS stands for Relational Database Management System. It is a software system that enables the creation, management, and administration of relational databases. RDBMSs are designed to store, organize, and retrieve large amounts of structured data efficiently. And RDBMSs provide a set of features and functionalities that allow users to create database schemas, define relationships between tables, insert, update, and retrieve data, and perform complex queries using the structured query language. They also handle aspects like data security, transaction management, and concurrency control to ensure data integrity and consistency. Uh, and of course, I've already gone through this, but these are the examples of some you know, popular open source as well as commercial uh, RDBMSs. We have Oracle, which I've already gone through, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, etc. And uh, just going over theoretically how they work, we have tables, which I've already explained, but tables are essentially the basic building blocks of a relational database. Uh, and they're also known as relations, or they could be known as relations. So a table consists of rows, also called records, and keep that terminology in mind, and columns, also known as attributes. Each row represents a unique record or instance of an entity. Very simple to understand, it's sort of like creating a table in, um, in Microsoft Excel, right? And each column represents a specific attribute or characteristic of that entity. So you could have, you know, within Excel, if you create a very simple system where in column A, you, you give that uh, the title of names, and then column B could be ID, column three, email address, column, um, col column four or column D, as it were, could be something like their, their age or their gender, and then each row represents a unique uh, record. Uh, so, you know, we could have a Lexis is uh, ID one. So actually in Excel, it would be uh, row, uh, row two would be uh, a Lexis and, you know, my all my attributes. And then the third one could be Mike, John, etc. So it's using that same system. It's really the relational aspect of these tables that is uh, quite important. And that's where we have keys, all right? So keys are used to uniquely identify records within a table and establish relationships between tables. The primary key is a column or a set of columns that uniquely identifies each row in a table. It ensures the integrity and uniqueness of the data. Foreign keys are columns in one table that reference the primary key of another table, establishing relationships between the tables, as you'll see shortly with the diagram. We uh, also have relationships. I also want to define this. So relationships define how tables are connected or associated with each other. And you may be wondering to yourself, why do tables need to be related to one another? Well, I'll explain that with a really useful example shortly. Uh, you know, common types of relationships include one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, and these relationships are established using primary and foreign keys, allowing data to be linked and retrieved across multiple tables. And of course, the structured query language, just as a final piece of terminology, um, and how it relates to relational database. So, you know, it's very important to understand. So, relational databases are typically accessed and manipulated using the structured query language. Uh, SQL provides a standardized language for querying, inserting, updating, and deleting data from relational databases, and it allows users to perform operations such as retrieving specific records, filtering data based on conditions, joining tables to combine data, which is where we have the union operator, and aggregating data using functions. So you can start to see everything come together. Now, how relational databases work. This is a sort of the example that I really wanted to show you. So let's say we have three tables, all right? So we have the first table. Again, none of them is a primary table or anything like that. Um, we have a table called students where we have uh, the unique key being the ID right over here where each uh, student has a unique ID which you know, uh, maintains the integrity. And then second column is the name. And then the entries, we have ID one points to Mike. Student ID 2 points to John, student ID 3 points to Mary. And then we have another table that would like to utilize the students table 
and the course is stable. And this table was set up uh, to essentially, let's say you have a web application that uh, allows you to enter or allows ad, uh, administrators or the dean of a university to see what uh, students are taking what courses and to assign students to particular courses. So obviously there's a students table where new, new students can be added with your own unique ID. And there's a courses table that's constantly being updated with regards to newer and newer uh, courses being added. So in order to see the, the link between student courses and uh, or to essentially start establishing that link between student course uh, between courses and student IDs or students themselves, a new table needs to be set up. And this is a uh, a relational table or this is where the whole relational concept comes into play, where it pulls data from two tables, which means they're all related now. And within this particular student courses uh, table, it's referencing the uh, student IDs and course IDs. So what that means is that student ID information is the key obtained from the students table, where in this case, we can see that student one or student with the ID of one is Mike is taking a course with the ID of uh, cross-site scripting. So just based on that, you can get your web application to query the values or these records from both of these tables, just by taking a look at the student's course table and then display that info. So uh, the next one would be Alexis, uh, so sorry, not Alexis, but Mike, uh, because they have the, it, you know, that uh, user or that student has an ID of one. Uh, and then uh, the database management system or the R DBMS checks for the course ID two from the courses table and says, okay, uh, Mike is taking Java uh, over here. And then we have a student uh, ID two, which is John. John is taking uh, the course Java. And then, you know, you get the idea. So this is what a relational database uh, is typically used for. And you can now start to see why this is so cool because you can you literally create tables um, with data from, uh, from different tables because they're related in some way, you know, and this is why they're used because you have a ton of data and you know, depending on the web application that you're developing, you could want to link those two pieces of data or data from multiple tables in order to make sense of something. So, you know, another a, a another table that could exist would be uh, a table with, um, let's say, um, let's say grades or something like that, that, you know, links to courses, and then they can all be linked to one another in, you know, a different table, they all relate to one another. The, the point I'm making is that, if any, if the attributes of the student, um, if the attributes of the records within the students table are modified, and let's say Mike uh, changes his phone number, that would also reflect here in the students courses table if that information is being pulled, right? So just keep that in mind. It's very important that you understand that if relationships are established, and going back to this definition here where you have one to many, uh, one to one, one to many, and many to many, uh, you know, these are established use, using, using primary and foreign keys. So the point I'm making is if given the fact that they're related, if data is updated in any of these, you know, primary, uh, primary tables, if you will, in this context, uh, then they'll also be updated or, you know, will be updated when this data is referenced from the student courses table. And uh, that brings us to NoSQL databases. So you may be uh, you may be wondering to yourself, uh, what does NoSQL mean? Well, in this context, or based on the abbreviated definition, NoSQL means not only SQL, and these are databases or a type of database management system that differ from traditional relational databases or RDBMSs in terms of the data model, scalability, and flexibility. So this is where they differ. All right. Now, NoSQL databases are designed to handle large volumes of unstructured, semi-structured, and rapidly changing data, and are commonly used in modern web applications, big data analytics, real-time streaming, content management systems, and other scenarios where the flexibility, scalability, and performance uh, advantages they offer are valuable. And we'll see this when we'll be exploring NoSQL injection. 
Uh, and, you know, there are several popular NoSQL databases that you may have heard of uh, before, each with their own strengths and use cases. And here are some examples of them. So we have MongoDB. MongoDB is a document database that stores data in a flexible JSON-like documents, and it provides scalability, high performance, and rich query capabilities. MongoDB is widely used in web applications, content management systems, and real-time analytics. And then we have Redis, of course. Redis is a very popular in-memory data store that supports various data structures, including strings, hashes, lists, sets, and, uh, and sorted sets. And it is known for its exceptional performance and low latency because it operates in memory or in RAM. And Redis is often used for caching, real-time analytics, session management, and uh, public or you know sub-messaging. And uh, yeah, so these are the examples uh, of um, NoSQL databases. So hopefully with this video, you now have a clear understanding as to the difference between the two. As I said, I'll be diving deeper into NoSQL databases because we've only really explored uh, relational databases. But that brings us now to the end, really, of the theoretical section of this course where I've given you the fundamentals that I wish I knew before I went into SQL injection attacks. You should now have an understanding as to what's going on in the background. You know what SQL injection vulnerabilities are all about, what causes them, the different types of SQL injection vulnerabilities, uh, what a SQL injection attack looks like, you know, databases work up the, you know, the primary types of databases, relational databases, RDBMSs, uh, and also NoSQL databases. So we can now turn our attention to the structured query language where we'll be taking a look at how uh, web applications interact with the database via uh, or through the use of the structured query language, how to write uh, or how to utilize the structured query language to retrieve data, modify, delete data from a relational database, etc. And then that'll take us to the next section where we'll be taking a look at how to use what we have learned on a real world web application in a lab to identify, to you know learn how to identify SQL injection vulnerabilities firstly, then we'll move on to the exploitation. So everything is in a structured, is set up in a structured way so that you know each section builds on uh, on one another. With that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. Introduction to SQL or the Structured Query Language. So welcome uh, to the SQL Primer or Fundamentals section of this course where I'll be introducing you to uh, SQL, um, sort of showing you how it works, uh, some of the important commands and syntax uh, to use or the rules to follow. Uh, we'll also be talking about special characters and of obviously escape characters and I'll be showing you some examples of what uh, SQL statements look like. We'll also take a look at how web applications utilize SQL queries to essentially make connections to a MySQL database, uh, you know, check data or retrieve data, so on and so forth. So this is going to be a theoretical video. And then in the next video, we'll be jumping into a lab uh, that will provide you with access to a SQL or MySQL database, if you will. Uh, where you will we'll be running various commands to show you what they look like and sort of taking what we've learned in this video and putting it all together. And uh, after these two, uh, after these two videos within this section, you should be, uh, you should have a really good understanding as to uh, what SQL queries mean. And when you'll be performing the injection, you'll, uh, you'll understand what each of those SQL payloads or queries does and why you are running them as opposed to running them blind. So let's get started firstly uh, by getting an understanding as to you know, what SQL is. So as I've mentioned many, many times before, SQL stands for the Structured Query Language, all right? And complex web applications will generally utilize a database, typically a rel relational database for storing data uh, you know, user credentials or statistics, content management systems, as well as simple personal web pages or web applications can connect to databases such as MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, PostgreSQL, and others. Now, in order to interact with databases, applications and web applications utilize a language called the Structured Query Language. It is a standardized language that allows you to, you know, access, manipulate, 
uh, update and uh, manage the data stored within a relational database in this case. So what is SQL, right? SQL or the Structured Query Language is a powerful interpreted language that can be used to extract and manipulate data from a database. Web applications embed SQL commands, also known as queries, in their server-side code in order to interact with the database and you know pull data, manage data, delete data, so on and so forth. Now, when it comes down to the actual uh, connection between web applications and um, and database and databases, the server-side code of a web application usually takes care of the of the process of establishing and maintaining the connection to the database, and it does this through the use of a database connector. All right, now database connectors also known as database drivers or database connectors, standard uh, simply put, are software components or libraries that provide an interface to connect and interact with specific databases from an application or programming language. Now, remember, I'm not referring to SQL here. I'm referring to the connector that essentially handles the connection and maintains the connection between the web application and the database. The language used is still the structured query language. So database connectors, um, essentially enable applications uh, to communicate with the database, execute queries, retrieve and modify data, and handle database transactions. And this diagram here sort of explains how it works, where you have the application or the web application, and then the connector. In the case of MySQL or most relational databases, you'll typically have uh, the connector being ODBC. We'll not dive into what ODBC is as a connector and how it works, but usually have that uh, essentially establishing and maintaining the connection between the application and the database, the relational database. In this case, MySQL is the example used here. So uh, when it comes down to the structured query language, what is important or essential to know uh, in the context of you know, being able to perform a successful SQL injection attack? Well, the first thing you need to understand is some very basic or fundamental SQL statement syntax. So how to write an SQL statement, how to you know, perform a query for specific data, how to combine the results of the two queries or of more than one or more than two queries with the union operator and how comments work. I would say that these are the most important aspects uh, or skills or bits of knowledge that you need to be aware of with regards to uh, SQL before you can perform a successful SQL injection attack. And you'll see why shortly. So what are these important SQL commands? Well, as you can see here, I've uh, sort of listed out a table with some of the most important commands that are uh, either utilized to read data, combine data, uh, insert new data, update an existing record, delete data, order data or you know limit the results based on specific criteria so the most common one or the most important sql command is the select command right this allows you to read data from the database based on specific search criteria and you'll see what this looks like as we'll take a look at a couple of examples and we'll take a look at how to do this practically in the next video we then have the union command which is used for union based sql injection this is used to combine the results of two or more select statements. We then have the insert command, which uh, is essentially used to insert a new record or new piece of data into the database or the table. Uh, we have the update command, which is used to update existing data or records based on specified criteria. So this is very useful for a web application, as you can imagine. It allows you to update uh, you know, specific records or specific attributes of specific records. You then have the delete command, which again does as it says, deletes existing data or records based on specified criteria. You then have the order by command, which is used to sort the result set in ascending or descending order. So sort of used to um, you know, modify how the data that you, uh, you are calling or you're referencing is displayed. In this case, you can sort it in ascending or descending order based on specific criteria. You then have the limit by command. This is used to retrieve records from one or more tables. And uh, again, we'll be taking a look at how to use each of these really, uh, I, fundamentally speaking, uh, as we proceed into the next video. But I just wanted to introduce them right now because they are quite important to know. Now, special characters. This is something that you'll see quite a lot with SQL injection payloads. You may have seen uh, you know, GitHub repositories or websites that list out SQL injection payloads. 
that you can use to, to essentially test and see if a website or web application is vulnerable to SQL injection. You may not have been familiar with the type of SQL injection uh, vulnerability or testing based on the payload you're using, uh, but nonetheless, you'll typically see a lot of these special characters being used in those payloads. So the first and most important one, and we'll actually uh, go through this in, uh, as we progress, is obviously the character string indicators. And that, that is typically denoted by either the single or double quote. You then have the multi-line comment, which is you know, denoted as follows. Uh, you then have the concatenation, the, ad the addition or concatenation um, command or character, if you will. Uh, the single line comment, which is uh, again, very important. This is denoted by a hash or a pound symbol or a double hyphen with no spaces. And that's a single line comment. The double pipe is used for concatenation. The percentage symbol is used uh, as a wildcard attribute indicator. Uh, you then have the variable um, or at variable, which is used you know, to specify a local variable. Double at vari uh, variable is used to specify a global variable. And then the wait for delay, this is not really a special character, but uh, the wait for delay command, if you will, and then the time options here allow you to specify a time delay. And of course, you can pretty much see just based on this table here, uh, which of these commands becomes useful for specific um, SQL injection vulnerabilities. So for example, in blind time-based SQL injection, the wait for delay is obviously a command that you, you'll see uh, referenced or used a lot in the SQLI payloads uh, designed for uh, blind time-based SQL injection. And uh, all of this will become relevant. You, you don't really need to know how it applies with regards to SQL injection, but it's important that you're aware of this syntax or these uh, special characters, if you will. Now, when we talk about uh, you know, some vital or important SQL statement syntax, and in this case, I've started off with the select uh, statement, um, you can see how simple it is. So we have a code snippet here where we're running a select, um, where we're utilizing the select command to display or to get data from a particular column, from a particular table, uh, based on a specific condition or criteria. So that's the, the basic syntax, right? Now, what does this look like? In this case, I've used an, an, an example. So in this case, a typical select or SQL statement or query looks like the following. Now, one thing I want to point out is you can see that at the end of my statement, there's a semicolon that essentially specifies within the SQL syntax that that is the end of that statement. And then anything after is considered another statement. Uh, this is not the union operator or uh, the distinct operator. This is you know, specifically saying that this is the end of this statement. Uh, execute this first and then give me the results and then execute anything after. The point I'm making is with the union operator, uh, what you do is you would use the union operator right over here. You'd not terminate it here. You say union and then run your other SQL query. And what it would do is it would combine the results from both into a single result set. And then you could add the terminator uh, or the, yeah, you could run the terminator at the end of that second SQL query. So in this particular case, if we take a look at the syntax here, what we're doing is we are selecting the columns. Uh, we're saying select from the column, um, from the columns called name and description or select data from the columns name and description from the table pro called products where the ID, and this is where we're referring to the key, if you remember when I had introduced you to relational databases, we had referenced a key. In this particular case, we are referring to a record with an ID of nine or an ID that is equal to nine. So the SQL code snippet above queries the database asking for the name and the description attributes or rather the values from that particular column of a record in the products table uh, in this example, the selected record has an ID uh, that is equal to nine. So we're essentially saying um, from the products table, I want you to look for the ID nine and I want you to get the, uh, I want you to give me data from the name and description columns for that particular record and only that. All right. Now the union statement syntax, as I said, is fairly easy to understand. We have the select statement and then we combine it with uh, union and then we specify another select statement. So 
as I said, if we go back to the, the table that has the definitions, a union statement allows you to combine the results of two select statements or two or more select statements. So you're not limited to just two, but this is what it would look like. In this case, we have uh, the initial select statement that I took from the original select example, where we say select name and description from products where the ID equals nine. And then we say union to combine. And then we, we specify the other SQL query. So where we say select, the price from products. So we're now uh, pulling info from a different column within the table um, within the table called products, again, matching or looking for the same ID or the same key, if you will, in this case, uh, the ID is set to nine. So the SQL code snippet above queries the database asking for the name and the description attributes or the values of those attributes of a record in the products table with an ID that is equal to nine, in addition to querying the database for the price uh, attribute value of the record with an ID that is also equal to nine. The point is the results of both of these queries will be displayed as a single, um, as a single result set. Uh, now with regards to comments, I think I need to highlight this because they'll be used quite a lot with the SQLI payloads. There are two strings uh, or two characters you can use to comment a line in uh, SQL. That is the hash symbol or the pound symbol or the two dashes or two hyphens as they're known, followed by a space. So an example of this is, you know, we say select field from the table. This is just basic syntax. We terminate that and then we can use the comment uh, symbol or the hash symbol to denote a comment. Uh, and the same goes for the actual two dashes where we can, you know, just type in a comment. So very, very simple, uh, almost, you know, comparative to other programming languages like Python where you, you, know, you may want to add a comment next to uh, a particular query. Now, this brings me to a very, important, um, a very important section that I want to cover uh, theoretically first, right? And that is how web applications utilize SQL queries. or How do they connect to databases and get the info that they're looking for? So the following is an example of PHP code that connects to a MySQL database and executes a particular SQL query and then displays the results on that particular PHP page or stores it uh, in a particular variable that can then be displayed in whatever page. So the first thing you will typically see with, you know, in this case, PHP applications is we have the database, um, the database parameters. So we have the database hostname or the IP of the database being stored in a variable called DB hostname. That's very common. If you've taken a look at a WordPress config or the WordPress config.php file, you'll see something similar to this. You then specify the database, the MySQL database credentials, where you have the username and the password. These are typically static as they are less likely to change. So the username and password, and then you also need to specify the database name. Uh, in this case, you know what database you want to connect to and uh, essentially interact with. Now the PHP code is fairly simple. We have a, um, and I've explained this uh, right over here. In this case, the this is a the connection object here, as it states here, is referencing the connection to the database. That's uh, where you have MySQL uh, or MySQL in uh, I connect, where we have the variable specified. So DB host name, DB user, DB password, DB name, and then we have the actual query here stored again in the form of a variable or the value of a variable. And then within, the, um, as the value of the variable, we have the SQL query that the developer of the web app uh, wants to perform. So where you can see select name, a description from products where ID three, union select username, password from accounts, and that is terminated there. Uh, we then have a results uh, variable, which is equal to MySQL I query in the connection and the query variable here or object and then the query uh, variable there and then display results and that is the value of the results variable so if we take a look at what this means the connection um, ob the connection variable is an object referencing the connection to the database the query variable contains the sql query my sqli query is a function which submits the query to the database and finally, the, the custom display results function renders the data. So display results is used to res, uh, render the data and uh, the results um, variable is what stores the results from the database. So at the end of this all, the query is executed or 
is sent to the database for processing. The database then returns the, the results. These are stored in the results variable. In this case, results equal to the uh, MySQLi query uh, function that contains the connection variable or the connection object and the query itself. This is the query variable. They are passed in as, um, as variables. Uh, and then we have the display results function, which again, in this case is a PHP function that then displays the, va the value of the results variable, which uh, was obtained from the database once it sends back the, uh, the data. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. And I've uh, obviously broken this down here where we have the database configuration, the connection configuration, the connection and authentication configuration. And then we have the query definition, which is in the form of a variable. The connection is made with the connection object right over here. And then uh, in this particular case, we have the submission. And then once it's returned, we have the usage of the results by the web application. Now, what you'll see quite, uh, quite frequently is, very, uh, is uh, vulnerable dynamic queries, all right? So most of the times, uh, queries are not static. They are indeed dynamically built by using uh, user inputs. And here's an example of a vulnerable dynamic query example where we have ID equals uh, get. So, you know, getting the ID from the actual, um, the actual user. And then there's the connection, which is the same thing here. The query is equal to select name and description from products or the products table where the ID equals the ID variable, which is, is getting from the actual user. And then uh, the results equals to that same MySQL I query function. And then uh, the display results function displays the results. Now, what does this mean? It means that uh, if we go to this, the next slide, the the previous example or the example I just showed you shows you some code where the uh, with, that utilizes user supplied input to build a query, the ID parameter of the get request. Um, and then so when a user makes a get request, the ID parameter is then passed in as the ID variable within the PHP code or the value of the ID variable. So the code then submits the query to the database. And uh, this behavior, obviously, as you can probably tell, is very dangerous because a malicious user can exploit the query construction to take control of the database interaction. So what does that mean? It means if this is dynamic, if the code allows uh, or takes the ID from the, uh, from the user, from their GET request, when they make a request, then what that means is that a user or attacker within their GET request can modify the ID uh, and inject their SQL code, uh, their malicious SQL code or query in there. And you can see that once they do that, they can probably uh, have it executed after this first statement by specifying a comment or using the comment uh, special character and then specifying their own code. So a good example of this uh, would be, and if I go right over here to the example section, you can see that we have the dynamic query here, select name description from products where the ID is equal to the uh, variable that stores the dynamic ID that was obtained from the uh, user's ID in the get request. So the ID, it expects the ID values in the form of an integer where you know uh, the id is either one in the form of an integer it could also be in the form of a string where it's you know example for example here and then both uh you know string and integer the point i'm trying to make here is what if we craft an id value uh, which can actually change the query so something like close it uh we close the initial query with uh you know the uh, the string um, special character, and then we use the OR operator, which is a logical operator in SQL, which works as well. And then we pass in a uh, logical statement that is always going to be equals to true or is always going to be true, something like A is equals to A. What, that, what happens then is that the query becomes, once we inject it, you can see select name description from products where the ID equals what we would inject inside that particular input is comment or equals a equals a and we don't need to specify any um we don't need to terminate we don't need to terminate the sql statement the uh, sql engine or interpreter will do that automatically but the point is 
what will happen here, if I go to the next slide here, what will happen is this particular query that I just showed you will tell the database to select all the items in the products table and it will display them if it's uh, if it's error based or it's an in-band SQL injection attack. So this tells the database to select the items by checking two conditions. Number one, the ID value must be empty uh, or an always true condition, right? Where A is equals to A, you'll typically see one equals one or something like that. While the first condition is not going to be met, the SQL injection will consider the second condition because we're using a logical operator like OR. This second condition is crafted as an always true condition. What that means, or in other words, as the slide tells us, is that um, the database, this will tell the database to select all the items within the products table. And as a result, all the data contained within the products table will be displayed. So that's typically what is done. What you'll typically see attackers do is leverage that um, dynamic ID and then you know pass in a, a SQL payload that is always going to be true. For example, in the users table, and then it'll dump the uh, the contents of the entire users table. You can also utilize a union. Um, you can also utilize the union operator to run a separate SQL query that then dumps maybe additional information in addition to the original info that was looking for the values of the columns for, you know, in this particular case, it appeared to be uh, the name and description. We can also say, you know, display the price as we had uh, explored in, in an earlier slide when we were taking a look at an example of, a, um, of how to use the union uh, operator. With that being said, uh, this may seem a little bit confusing theoretically from a you know, from a theoretical perspective, but it's very important that we go through it beforehand. In the next video, we're going to be now jumping into uh, SQL into a um, into an actual database, and we'll be utilizing an SQL interpreter to run our commands on a real WordPress database. And I'll show you uh, pretty much all of these commands, and I'll show you how we can utilize or you know what payloads are typically used by attackers, and you'll actually see it work. So. With that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. SQL Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how to write our own SQL queries. And the way we're going to be doing that is through the use of a practical lab. So this video has a lab associated or attached to it. And you can choose to go through the video first and then go through the lab after, or you can go through it in tandem as you're watching the video. Uh, in either case or uh, scenario, uh, feel free to, to use whatever approach works for you. The objective of this video is to show you how to write SQL queries and uh, to sort of give you a tacit feel for what an SQL query uh, looks like and you know when to use what uh, query, so on and so forth. So this lab is uh, really, really helpful. Um, once you start it, it'll provide you with access to a web graphical user interface or a web database management tool that will allow you to write SQL queries and uh, play around with the MySQL database from within your browser. Uh, you don't need to log in via the MySQL terminal client, although that is an option. You'll pretty much be able to do exactly as you would or as you could with the MySQL uh, terminal or CLI client. So uh, all you need to do is just fire up the lab and I'll be going through it um, in a systemic order in that I'll show you how to run the various uh, commands that we spoke about where you know we were taking a look at in the previous video at the select uh, command uh, as well as the union command the insert delete so on and so forth and in addition to that i'll show you what the query looks like when an attacker injects a sql payload and you know what that looks like from the server side so you can see that the MySQL server or database has no option or really doesn't know that it's not a legitimate SQL query or, uh, you know, it doesn't know that, that it's not a legitimate uh, piece of data or, uh, you know, a value for a particular parameter and can make that decision on in and of its own.
the web application must sanitize or validate user input. Otherwise, the SQL database will execute whatever it's told to execute. With that being said, I'm going to switch over into the lab environment, which is essentially just going to be a browser window and we can get started. So uh, I'll see you there. All right, so I am back within the lab environment. And as I said, it's just a browser window. Uh, you will be provided with a login page to a service or web GUI called OmniDB, which essentially allows you to manage your database, uh, you know, fairly easily through a graphical user interface or a web user interface, uh, you know, within your browser. Uh, and we just uh, we can log in with the credentials you've been provided within this lab, which are just admin and admin for the user and password, and just click on sign in. That's going to take you to the dashboard, and uh, you want to give it a couple of second, uh, a couple of seconds, sorry. So there we are. Just give it a few seconds to load up, and I'm just going to zoom in now. Uh, when uh, once you've logged in, you're going to have very simple user interface where you'll have a console and a query console. Uh, this is the tab we're interested in specifically. So it's going to be divided into two panes. You're going to have the query and then the resultant data of your query. And at the top right here, make sure or always keep uh, your eye on this little connection icon here. Uh, which will tell you whether you are connected to your MySQL database. So on your left, you can actually see that the MySQL database is running on localhost port uh, 3306, which is the default port for MySQL connections. And if you open up the uh, database tree here, you can actually view the various databases within the MySQL database. And then if I click, for example, on the WordPress database, you then have the various tables within the database. So we're not using the graphical user interface. Remember, our job is to, or rather my job is to show you how to run SQL queries. Firstly, to give you an idea as to how all of this works, right? Uh, which is sort of my primary objective. So I'll show you how to navigate around using SQL queries, how to uh, display data from particular tables, how to, you know, uh, modify data, how to make, uh, how to write queries to get specific data, how to delete data, how to create a new table, so on and so forth. So uh, let's get started. So to begin with, uh, and again, this is not really tied to SQL injection or any SQL payload that you'll be running. I'm just showing you how to navigate around. Uh, one of the first things you want to do or when you're, you're utilizing SQL or the structured query language is, of course, we can list out the databases, right? Now, this is a sample. This is a very simple uh, SQL query where we are essentially asking the interpreter to display the list of databases within the MySQL database. And remember, we utilize the semicolon as a delimiter, which means that is uh, the end of the statement. So if we run this, you can do that by just clicking on the play button here. And I'll just zoom in so you can see this much more clearly. Uh, you can see that the resultant data displays uh, the list of databases within the MySQL database. So we have an information schema database, a MySQL database. These are usually ref uh, reserved to MySQL, uh, as well as the performance schema database. We then have one called test and WordPress database or WP database. So this is uh, this MySQL database contains a database that is used by a WordPress website. So what if I wanted to um, utilize or interact with a particular database and see what's in there? Well, to do that, I could say use and then the name of the database. So in this case, WordPress database, and I run that and it's going to tell me done. All right. So that's a Boolean result, which tells me true or false. Now, um, if I now, uh, what I can do now is obviously show the tables within this database, and that can be done by typing in uh, show tables like so. And again, make sure to always use the delimiter. And I list that out and it'll tell me tables in WordPress database. We have uh, 13 tables and uh, we have, you know, uh, WordPress comment meta, WordPress comments, WordPress links, and some really important ones or some uh, really cool tables that uh, an attacker would be obviously trying to target, one of them being WordPress users. So I assume that uh, user accounts are contained within that particular table. So what does this mean? What if I wanted to display uh, all of the uh, all of the records within the WordPress users table. Well, to do that, I could utilize the select um, the select command. So it says select. And now I can choose to display because I'm going in this blind, I can choose to display specific columns within that particular 
uh, within that particular table or I can list out everything. So I can say select and then use the asterisk or the wildcard denominator here and say select all from and uh, this is where we say WordPress users and now I'll use the delimiter. So I'm essentially saying show me everything contained within the table WordPress users. I run that. It's going to show me that we have the following user accounts, right? So in this particular case, the special key is listed here as ID. The username is admin. The user uh, password is uh, in a hashed or encrypted format, as you can see here. The nice name or the nickname, as it were, is uh, admin, the user email, so on and so forth, right? So this is the information contained with, within the WordPress users, um, within the WordPress users table. Now, uh, typically what you'll see um, when web applications are, you know, trying, for example, to authenticate is they would say select, um, they would say select user uh, login. This would be an example query, uh, you know, from a web application. So select user login from WordPress users. And then we could say where the ID is equal to one. All right. In this case, we know there's only one user account. So if I list that out, it's only going to display that information or that particular column uh, or the value for that, you know, particular attribute for that record. So uh, we're essentially using the special key here. So what we could also do is say, um, we can say display all the tables. So select all from WordPress uh, we can display all the rows. So select all from the table WordPress users where name or user login, uh, user login equals, and in this case, we, this would be a string. So we would say Alexis right now. If we run that, this is an example of what would happen when, uh, when we try to log in. So this would be the server side code that interacts with the database. And this is the probably the injectable, um, the injectable parameter here. All right. So again, this is just an example. This is not typically how it works, but you can see nothing is returned back. And now the web application knows what to do when they get a response like this. They know that, that either that user doesn't exist or the login is invalid. So the point I'm trying to make here is if we go back and say select all from WordPress users and display everything within that particular table, we get all of the columns or all of the attributes for all of the records. Uh, right over here. And in this case, you can see we only have uh, one particular user called admin. Now, as we saw in the previous video within the slides, we can also specify more, uh, more than one attribute. So we could say, you know, select user, uh, login. And again, I'm referencing columns that actually exist within the database. So user login and user password uh, from WordPress users. And this is typically what web applications will also do. So there we are. Uh, so we're now referencing the user login and user pass. And what would happen is the application or the query would look something like this. So select user login, user pass from WordPress users where uh, user login, this is what a login would look like is equal to Alexis. And we can use the and operator uh, user pass. So we're not using an or operator, otherwise that would not make any sense is equal to password one, two, three. Of course, this would have to be in a hashed format, but we run this and you can see that is invalid. Now, if we said uh, admin and a user password is equal to password one, two, three, that would also not return a result because that's not the correct uh, credentials. Now, if we change this to an or just to show you, you know, how flexible SQL is or the structured query language is, it will uh, essentially run either one of these operations. Uh, so if this one is not correct, it's going to run this particular operation or we'll just run this here. You can see, and this is now listed out. So very, very robust, A typical web application. You know, this would be probably the name variable or username variable in PHP. And then uh, this one would be pass here and uh, user pass equals to uh, password, right? This is typically what a uh, query would look like uh, from a web application or from the web application whereby this would be substituted based on what the user entered in the username field on the web application. And this is what, be, what would be substitu uh, substituted in the password field in the web application. And uh, 
you can see if we now run this here, you can see it's going to tell us that we have an error in our SQL syntax. So this actually brings me to an important point. Um, in this particular case, we're getting an error. Now, this is, uh, in essence, error-based SQL in injection. Now, this is a much more complicated example, but uh, what happens if within the user login um, within the user login parameter, the user you know puts in a single quote, and in the password they can enter something legitimate like password, and we hit run. In this particular case, it doesn't give us anything there, but if we leave this blank and we run this here, still nothing. Uh, we can try and play around with it here where we can enter maybe a single quote there or something in there. Let's try this. And uh, let me get rid of this and operation there and we'll close that up there. Sorry, let me just close that up and we run this. In this particular case, we're not uh, getting anything because that's a string. Now, if we put in uh, a single quote there and we hit run, it's going to tell us that we have an error in our SQL syntax. So what does this mean? Uh, what this means is that in certain cases, parameters, as they are being in, uh, passed into the web application, can either be in the form of an integer or a string. And this is something you need to be aware of. Now, uh, what do I mean when I say this? Let's get rid of the user pass option or we can actually keep it both say user login, select user login from WordPress users where user login or where rather the ID and this is going to be an integer now where ID equals and this could be one right now. This is correct because we know that the key, um, the key right over here is uh, obviously correct, um, meaning that that user exists if we hit 20. You can see that it doesn't exist. Now, what an SQL injection attack is, is when you uh, essentially inject a payload into this particular parameter, right? Therefore, being passed into the SQL database and, and executed. So what you typically do is, in, in the case of error-based SQL injection, is you do something like uh, something like this, where you could say 20, um, and you don't need to pass in le a legitimate value, but you just hit enter and you can see that it says that uh, we have uh, an error and it points to the fact that our uh, syntax is incorrect. Now, what does that tell the attacker when they just uh, input a single quote, um, a single quotation mark, is that the injection was successful. That means that the SQL query is being processed by the database and the results returned tell us that that is the case. Now, when you talk about a case where we can sort of bypass a login, is when we utilize um, when we can when we utilize a an option or a calculation as it were or an expression that is always going to be true where again going back to the slides we can say a is equal to a which is always true and we hit run you can see that it will now display uh, the value pretty much all the values from uh, from WordPress users uh, from uh, specifically the user login uh, column. Now, if we were selecting, you know, all the data from the WordPress users table, this would then display everything. So there we are. So what happens is when we use a logical operator like or even if this one is not false, which in this case it is because there isn't a user account with an ID of 20, uh, it'll then execute this operation, which is always going to be true and therefore displays uh, all the data from within the WordPress users table. Uh, and you can see that here. So that's an example of what happens when SQL injection is performed. Now, uh, there's a few other options that I want to cover. Uh, obviously, we talked about select and union, and I think union probably would be the best option to, to sort of highlight here. So what happens is, um, let me uh, set this to one. So again, we know that this is correct, and that is a, a SQL query. Now, when um, what I want to do is uh, let's try and show a few other tables here. So I'm going to say show tables. And again, I'm just doing that so that I'm aware of what I can do. But uh, we can say, uh, let's see, select um, all from WordPress posts, right? Um, and we run this, this is going to display everything, sorry, select from WordPress posts, that's going to display all the, the actual posts on the WordPress blog, and they all have their unique uh, ID or key, if you will, 
and um, the number of records is four, etc. Now, what happens with union is we can use it to combine. We can say select all from WordPress users where the ID is equal to one. All right, and we run this here. So if we run this here, you can see the used select statements have different number of columns. Okay, so what does this mean? What this means is that we are trying to, again, uh, combine the results of two uh, queries that do not have similar data, which means that, you, you know, this option here, the union is really useful when you want to do, uh, you know, specifically in the case of SQL injection. The way this would work, uh, the way this would work is if we said, uh, you know, WordPress posts where the ID is one. So we're running two operations. Now, in this case, the database is not connected, which means I'm going to have to, uh, if I say show databases, uh, let's see, there we are. So I'll now say use and we'll run it again, WordPress database. Don't worry if you get that error, you just need to select the database again. And then now if I show tables, uh, there we are. So I'll say show tables and um, there we are. So we can now say, you know, select uh, select all from um, WordPress posts, right? And I'll show you how we can use the union operator here. So I can now say select all from WordPress posts and union uh, select from uh, WordPress posts where the um, let's try something. The post title is equal to sample page. All right. Very, very simple. We run this here. And now you can see in this particular case, it's going to run both of those queries and it's going to output, um, it's going to output the result of both. Now, in this case, you're not seeing this, but what we can do is we can modify the initial one and say select uh let's see uh we'll say the post uh, we'll select the post author um we'll say post author from wordpress posts where the uh where the post author post author is going to be equal to one and then union select and run that here in this particular case the used uh, select statements have a different number of columns now this as i said going back to the initial demonstration is where there's uh, obviously an error based on what you're trying to get. So if we now say if we get rid of post author there and we run this here, you can now see it It combines both. You're not able to see it. But as I said, the, the area where this is used is, you know, especially the one, uh, the example where I wanted to highlight or that I wanted to highlight is in the case of um, is in the case of a SQL injection uh, attack. And I'll be able to, to demonstrate that now. Uh, there's also uh, there's also the other options that we had talked about or the other commands we had talked about. For example, the ability to create a new uh, table um, and uh, a couple of others. One that I wanted to highlight before we do that is, uh, for example, select all from uh, WordPress uh, WordPress posts. What if we wanted to order by the post title? You remember? And we want to limit it, we can say limit is two one, and we'll run this. In this particular case, you can see that that uh, applies correctly. So um, very, very simple, right over here. So in this particular case, we're retrieving a particular row from the table. And, uh, you know, we can uh, we can use some of the other options. I don't think we need to take a look at creating a new table, but uh, we can. Uh, it's uh, fairly simple. What we would need to do is uh, we would go ahead and say create table and we'll say new users. And uh, within this, because this is going to be multi line uh, within here, we would specify the option. So we would say the column name. So this is going to be name and we'll say this is going to be a uh, variable here and we'll say name ID and limit that there. And then now we need to specify the primary key. 
or this particular uh, table and that's going to be primary key is going to be id and uh, now in this particular case it looks like we may have an issue so i'm just going to copy that there we try and run this uh, yeah so we'll need to run this again so show databases because we lost a connection to the database and we're going to say uh, use wordpress database there we are and run that there and now we can just paste in what i uh, typed in there there we are so in this case um, we have an error in our syntax. So create table. Uh, yes, what we want to do is use comments there because this is multi-line. So not comments, but commas. So name ID. Let's also add one more here, like email. Uh, also limit that there and we'll uh, use a comma there. And we don't need a comma for this one here. So we'll run this here. And there we are, we've created the new table. So now we say show tables and we list this out there you can see we have new user now what if we wanted to insert new rows or records into that table what we would do is we would say insert into a wordpress database um, we're specifying it explicitly but we could also say once we've selected it we could say new um, new users values and then within a uh, within brackets here we would specify the values as they um as in the order of the column so we'd say john uh, we could use an example here so we'll say john and then the email for john is just john at uh, ina.com and then we would use a um, comma there and specify the value um right over here so name email and then the id we could say you know ine one, two, three, four as the ID there. And again, this is in the form of a string. So uh, insert um, into new users values. Um, and uh, yeah, that should work. So I'll run this here. Uh, WordPress database new users doesn't exist. That's interesting. What if we just say um, WordPress database explicitly run this here doesn't exist that's very interesting so let me just copy that so show tables and um, we have new user sorry about that that's my mistake so as you can see the um this is not new users but new user and we'll run that there and that's executed without any issues so now we say um, select all from new user and we run this here you should you can see that uh, the record is added there and we can see the columns and uh, you know these represent the attributes and the values of the attribute so very very simple to you know create a table insert uh, new data now what if we wanted to modify um what if we wanted to modify one of the um what if we wanted to modify one of the uh, the attributes for this particular uh, for this particular record or for a particular user in the table that we just created? Uh, now, what we could do is say update, and we would say new user. We can reference the table itself, or then or the database, and then the table, as I showed you um, previously. And we say set the uh, we then specify the the value that we want to modify. So in this case, we could say email set email. Uh, is equal to, and we could say John has changed his email to JJ at uh, INE.com and we'll need to reconnect because uh, this is not going to work. Uh, but we'll say, actually, let's uh, say uh, WordPress database dot new user set email JJ at INE.com. Now, remember, we need to specify the actual key here uh, and uh, the primary key because this is what allows us to uh, again, modify data using the key identifier. In this case, the primary key is just a column that we called I, uh, ID. And in this case, we will need to say where the ID, uh, where, uh, say where ID is equal to, and in this particular case, we know the ID was one, two, three, four, and we then run this. So I'm gonna run it, that looks like it's done. And uh, we're now going to say select um, from WordPress data uh, database dot new uh, user. There we are. 
And if we check that out now, you can see that that email, uh, the attribute or rather the value for the email attribute has been updated for the record with an ID of INE1234. So again, as you can see, it's fairly simple to understand as long as you, um, as long as you're aware of what's going on. Um, now, I want to show you the union option here. Uh, and this is uh, quite important. So um, I think what we can do is let's try and run one that I know will work. So we'll say select um, WordPress database dot, uh, I know one of the names of the uh, tables here, and that's user. Uh, so we'll say user login. Um, actually, in this, uh, we'll just say user login. That's the attribute there, number one, and then we'll say user email as well from WordPress database dot um, WordPress users, that's the table. And we'll then say union, select name and email from WordPress database dot new user or the table that we just created. And we'll run this. And now you can see that that is combined. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you a more practical example when talking about union. Uh, so in this particular case, remember, we uh, want to match the number of columns. We cannot combine or use union to combine the results of two select queries or two or more select queries if the number of columns does not match, which means if you're, uh, if you're trying to get the, um, the values or you're trying to use select to get the values of, um, of keys or the attribute values of keys, uh, you need to make sure that the, the number of columns matches. So that's what union is used for you. As you can see, it combines them into two. Now in the, in the context of SQL injection, the way this is typically used is you'd use union um, to try and do a little bit more. So for example, select user login, user email from WordPress database dot WordPress users union. And we can now say uh, in this particular case, uh, what you do when you performing user or union based SQL injection is say union. And um, you run a another select operation and utilize a um, another operator or even a logical operator like and or or um, where you can say, for example, in this particular case, you know, or one is equal to one. And uh, that would ideally give us an error here because of what we've displayed. So because new from uh, WordPress data, new user, there we are. Yeah, so that would give us an error still, but you get the idea. This will become, uh, this will make much more sense as we progress. Um, now, what we can try and do um, is obviously uh, the final thing or the final, uh, you know, piece of, or the final command I wanted to sort of highlight here is going to be the process of uh, deleting, which, um, you know, is fairly simple. It's pretty much, uh, there's nothing too complicated about it, but uh, what we could do now is uh, let's say we wanted to say uh, select, I just want to see select from WordPress database dot uh, new user. Let's list out everything in there. What if we wanted to delete one of them? What we could say one of these records is we could say delete uh, from then we specify the table name uh, that I'm referencing it um, by saying, uh, by providing the name of the database and then the table name. So new user, WordPress database dot new user, where the, we want to use the actual ID. So ID equals to INE1234. All right, so that's the primary key there. And we run this and that's done. And now we say, um, show all from, uh, WordPress or WordPress database dot new user. All right. Not show, but rather select and run that there. And you can see we deleted that particular record. So, uh, hopefully all of this makes sense. Now, as I said, the graphical, uh, or the web interface here provided by OmniDB allows you to do all of this manually where you can alter the database, drop it or delete it. If we go into tables, you have the ability to create a table or create a table with SQL or using the graphical user interface. But as I've just shown you, it is fairly simple. So if I say again, just to highlight, uh, 
the navigation, show databases. We have this here. I've shown you how to create a table, how to interact with it, how to display information from the table, etc. I think the final aspect that I want to touch on here is going to be the time delay, which uh, will come into play when we're talking about blind SQL injection and time-based um, SQL injection. So let me show you what that looks like. So what we can do now is I will say select all from um, we'll say WordPress, WordPress database dot WordPress users. So the WordPress users table uh, where the ID is equal to one or we can say 20. And what a SQL injection attack would be is let's say we run this, right? So we know that the ID 20 doesn't exist to inject this. What we could say is uh, use the or operator and say sleep uh for five seconds and then use the comment option there or the comment symbol or character and run this so now this will take five seconds therefore you know telling you that this is working now if there was some form of input validation let's say we had left this blank this would still run because remember there's an or operation not an and operator uh, this would not display anything but what we could do in addition to this is then append this with uh, something like a union. Instead of using a comment there, we could say union select, uh, sorry, select all from WordPress, uh, WordPress database dot uh, WordPress users and uh, try and display this. This will take five seconds and uh, we'll give it there we are so it ran that there so it's going to run this particular option and then the union here select from wordpress database uh, dot wordpress users um, where the id is equal to and we'll leave this as is and we can then run a uh, an error based attack where we can say or one equals one uh, right over there and then run this here again five seconds this is sort of how you'd combine uh, you, how you'd combine uh, sql payloads now in this case you can see the initial one we don't we are not providing any values if we said this was uh, something like 20 sorry where the id was something like 20 and uh, we could also you know specify the value within the actual other query here so we could say uh for example uh, ID here would also be something like 20. We can uh, omit the comment option there and then uh, just use the union operator. And if we run this now, you can see that we can combine SQL queries. And uh, again, in this case, we have utilized a time-based option right over there or a delay or a sleep option for five seconds. It confirms that SQL injection is possible. Uh, based on the time taken and that's how that works. So that is going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so that is how to write basic SQL queries. Uh, I sort of wanted to give you a practical way to, you know, learn about, uh, learn more about SQL, how to write queries, how to interact with the database and uh, the tables within that database. So we've taken a look at uh, pretty much all of the options that I wanted to highlight. And I've sort of shown you or given you a basic idea as to what it looks like from the uh, from the database's perspective once you inject a particular payload. So it'll take the original query and then append to it, you know, the, the actual query that you want to inject as we've been able to see. So just wanted to, to give you that uh, basic uh, idea and overview as to how to write basic uh, query uh, SQL queries to do various things and you know primarily focus on the select union and uh, you know the logical operators that uh, you know allow you to play around with the execution of the SQL queries like for example the sleep option which is very useful in the time based SQL injection attacks or vulnerabilities uh, with that being said, we have now covered databases and this brings us to the end of the first section of the course where we were getting, you know, um, we were getting an understanding or getting to grips with the fundamentals of SQL injection attacks and, you know, sort of covering or giving you an idea as to the vulnerability itself, what causes it, uh, the various types of SQL injection vulnerabilities, how databases work, uh, specifically, you know, the, in the case of relational databases, uh, you know, the fundamentals of SQL and uh, 
I think we're now ready to turn our attention to the practical side of this course, which is section two, where we'll be covering, we'll start off in the next section by taking a look at how to identify SQL injection vulnerabilities, uh, what you need to do. Of course, we'll start off by doing this manually and taking a look at basic examples and then building up from there. And, and then obviously, once we're done with uh, the exploitation, the manual identification and exploitation, We'll also touch upon the automation of this process with tools or frameworks like SQL Map, and uh, we'll then take it from there and wrap up the course. So with that being said, that's going to be it for this video, and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hunting for SQL Injection Vulnerabilities in this video and in this section specifically uh, named or titled Finding SQL Injection Vulnerabilities, we're going to be taking a look at how to identify SQL injection vulnerabilities, uh, both manually and automatically. However, in this video, what I'm going to be outlining is the process or the methodology behind that. So if you, uh, if you actually remember in the introductory section or the uh, SQL injection fundamental section of this course, where I introduce you to SQL injection vulnerabilities, I sort of highlighted uh, a few important aspects uh, with regards to the successful exploitation of the vulnerability. And uh, one of them, or rather two of those uh, parameters or requirements for successful SQL injection is firstly the identification of an application input that interacts with the database, therefore allowing for some form of injection. And the second uh, parameter requirement is that the web application should have no or very little input sanitization or user input validation. And really that's what we're going to be focusing on primarily. So sort of giving a, you an idea as to how uh, you can go about finding SQL injection vulnerabilities, what to look out for in terms of application inputs, uh, and the general methodology behind it. And I'll also be covering quite a lot of uh, um, of other helpful uh, techniques and uh, I'll be providing you with very useful information that you can utilize when performing uh, you know your manual checks which is what we'll be focusing on firstly so to begin with uh, you know it goes without saying that in order to exploit a SQL injection vulnerability you first have to identify an injection point or an application input within the web application after which you can craft an SQL query or payload that can be injected in an injectable parameter and we'll talk all we'll we'll explore a little bit more about parameters but for now uh you know i've sort of highlighted that uh the, you know the three primary requirements for successful sql injection number one uh you need to find an application input number two or rather yeah number two you need to find an application input that uh does not have any input validation and one that uh, is interacting with the database or rather one that is passing data uh, or it, you know, is sending data to the database either for validation or for creation, or you know, data be, is being updated, etc. And you know, a simple example of this is a login form where it's uh, self-explanatory uh, with regards to you know why and how uh, data is being sent into the web application, and it makes sense that a username and password would be sent to the database for verification, especially when you're talking about user accounts. Um, so yeah, so those are the three requirements. Number one, an application input. Number two, uh, the application input needs to be in some way or form uh, be interacting with the database. And uh, thirdly, a lack of proper uh, input validation. So with that being said, the most straightforward way to find SQL injection vulnerabilities within web applications or websites is to probe its inputs with special characters. And I'll go over that, even though I went through this uh, in the introduction to SQL or the structured query language video, I'll go over this again. But you know, we need to probe the application inputs with special characters that are known to cause the SQL query to be syntactically invalid, therefore forcing the web application to return an error. So when we talk about, uh, you know, identifying the vulnerabilities, so not really the exploitation per se, even though the identification is part of the exploitation, 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to validate whether injection is possible. And the easiest way uh, of doing that is through error-based uh, SQL injection. Now, we'll also be exploring, you know, what blind uh, SQL injection looks like from the perspective of validating that, you know, a SQL injection vulnerability exists. However, the most common type is obviously error-based, and this is where you have the use of special characters. It's the most straightforward and easiest way because it's an in-band SQL injection attack uh, in that the error is returned uh, or is commu uh, the error or the results from the injection are communicated back via the same uh, communication channel or simply put the error is sent back via the web application and is displayed usually on the web page uh, or the page where you actually made the injection. Uh, now, one thing to note, and this comes to my first point when I was talking about the three requirements for successful SQL injection is that uh, you must note that not all of the inputs in a web application will interact with the database. What I mean there is that it is always recommended to perform reconnaissance on the web application firstly uh, and categorize the different input parameters before you, you actually begin performing SQL injection tests. I've already gone over this or highlighted this process within this learning path for this certification in a course uh, on information or on web information gathering and enumeration, where I outlined the process of how you know you go about mapping out the web application, performing both passive and active reconnaissance on it, and part of that, which also leads into the web proxies course, uh, shows you how to you know essentially find. Uh, these uh, application inputs. And uh, once you've identified them, you can perform a bit more reconnaissance on them to, to sort of get an understanding of what they do and whether that data is indeed, uh, you know, passed into the database or uh, are, you know, is potentially injectable. So it's very important to keep that in mind. So the, the crescendo here of my point is that you need to have performed uh, good or successful enumeration or information gathering or reconnaissance on the web application before you can uh, start testing uh, for SQL injection vulnerabilities. That process will save you a lot of time, uh, you know, in the actual, uh, in the overall process of uh, finding vulnerabilities, regardless of whether they're in uh, the injection vulnerabilities or cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, etc. So that brings us to the first point or the first requirement, and that is finding injectable fields. So from my experience and the experience of web app pen testers and bug bounty hunters, what are some of the most common injectable fields that you should look out for? Well, number one, you're obviously going to be uh, dealing with login forms, right? So the username and password fields in a login form are commonly or are common targets for SQL injection attacks. So if the application does not properly validate or sanitize the user input, an attacker may be able to manipulate the SQL query that is used for authentication and inject the SQL payload or query uh, into uh, one of the parameters or rather the values uh, for one of the parameters and then, you know, uh, utilize special characters if it's a string based injection to uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, that you use, a, you know, for example, a single quote as a delimiter and then you specify your SQL query after. We'll take a look at this in the next video where we'll actually get started with some labs. Uh, but yeah, it's very important uh, that, uh, you know, you obviously take a close look at uh, login forms. Uh, the next injectable field that you know you'll typically want to test are uh, is search boxes or are search boxes. So input fields used for searching within an application are potential targets for SQL injection, obviously, because they allow you to input data. And in certain cases, this search query is referenced by the web application. And then uh, in certain cases, the web application will make a query or we'll interact with the database to try and see whether, you know, for example, in the case of content management systems or blogs, whether that search query matches any particular blog or any string within a, the body of a particular blog or the title of a particular blog. So that's an example, right? So if the search query is directly incorporated into an SQL statement without proper validation, an attacker can inject malicious SQL code or queries to manipulate the query and potentially access unauthorized data. Uh, some other injectable fields are obviously URL parameters. Uh, this is not usually understood, but as I said in the next video when we'll be using a lab, uh, 
I'll actually show you this and what it looks like. So web applications will often utilize URL parameters to pass data between pages. If the application uses these parameters directly in constructing SQL queries without proper validation and sanitization, it can be susceptible to SQL injection attacks. Now, some of the other ones, and these are usually not uh, thought of, especially by beginners or, you know, if you're getting started with this, you would not really consider these injectable fields based on, you know, their purpose and how they work. Uh, so the other ones, of course, are form fields. So any input fields in forms such as registration forms, contact forms or comment fields. And the one that I'm uh, that I've really seen quite a lot is comment fields. So. Again, going back to the example of a content management system like WordPress, on WordPress, uh, on WordPress blog posts, you typically have uh, by default the ability to write uh, or post a comment. Now, the great thing with comments is uh, comments are typically need to be stored and referenced somewhere. Now, they can be linked to the page themselves. However, in order to correctly reference, and this is where the whole relational uh, database uh, uh, methodology or functionality comes into play, uh, a, a user firstly needs to be logged in, right? You need to have an account on the WordPress site in order to post a comment. Now this can be changed, but that's typically how it works. So you create an account, where does that data go? It goes into the relational database. So think of a MySQL database. It's a relational database. So you know that that data can be interpolated or used or linked or related to other tables. Now, in the case of WordPress, what happens is for every post, uh, or rather what will typically happen is you'll typically see a table for comments and this comment pulls data from the user's table. So essentially tying a user account to a particular comment, that obviously makes sense because you want to be able to identify who is typing in that comment. And if they have a user account, you want to be able to open up their user account and find out more about them. And, uh, the second table that this third table will reference is going to be the actual post, the blog post uh, or the blog posts, uh, the WordPress posts table as it's called, so that it links that comment to that particular blog post. And then this information is referenced or is available or is accessible via that uh, WordPress comments table. So. As you can see, these are, this is obviously one that you need to be, uh, you need to pay attention to. So if the input is not properly validated uh, and or sanitized before uh, being used or before being input, then uh, SQL injection is uh, possible. Uh, some other injectable fields are hidden fields. So this is typically uh, hidden fields in HTML forms. Um, and this is not that common, but it, it is possible. So hidden fields in HTML forms can also be susceptible to SQL injection attacks if the data from these fields is again directly incorporated into SQL queries without proper validation. And I'll talk a little bit about parameters and the types of parameters that you'll typically be dealing with and what I mean, and we've already seen this actually in the SQL fundamentals video, uh, what I mean when I when I say parameters, but now you'll get an actual tacit sense of what I'm talking about. And finally, and this is something that a lot of beginners uh, sort of avoid or uh, ignore, and that is cookies, right? Now, this is not that common, but it is uh, nonetheless an injectable field. Uh, cookies containing user data or session information may be used in SQL queries. That's, uh, you know, you can obviously tell why that would be important. So if the application does not, again, validate or sanitize the cookie data properly, it can lead to SQL injection vulnerabilities. So these are the common injectable fields. Now, you've identified uh, or you're aware of the common injectable fields. Uh, you have some that you want to test. How do you go about finding or testing for SQL injection vulnerabilities from a methodology perspective? So identifying SQL injection vulnerabilities typically involves a combination of both manual and automated testing, which is why I'm going to go through this process sequentially. So we'll start off in the next video uh, with the practical lab. Uh, by performing manual testing, and then we'll move on and then utilize something like OASP Zap, and I'll show you how to do that. That is sort of somewhat uh, semi-automated. And then when we move on to the exploitation section of this course, I'll be utilizing SQL Map. And the reason I'll be doing that is because that's the best way uh, to learn how to use SQL Map is through practical examples and you know putting it through different use cases. So when you when it comes down to manual testing, 
the first thing you typically want to do is perform manual testing with malicious input. So try injecting SQL statements or special characters like the single quote into input fields such as login forms, search boxes or URL parameters. Uh, and what you want to do is look for unexpected behavior, error messages, or any indications that the input is being interpreted as SQL code. So you're really looking for any sign that what you've just injected is being sent to the database. And this comes to the second requirement, which is the fact that the login or application input needs to be interacting with the database. So you're looking for any indication. And again, this can also be blind where you use something uh, like time-based injection, uh, but you're just looking for anything, any indication at all uh, as to whether or not the query or the special character that you've just injected is being executed or is being interpreted by the, uh, by the actual database. And uh, we'll, as I said, be exploring this. Now, this can obviously be broken down into error-based testing where you submit intentionally malformed input to trigger SQL queries that can reveal underlying database errors or SQL statements being executed. And of course, we'll also touch on this. Uh, we then have, of course, union-based testing where we inject union select statements into input fields that can... Um, that will allow us to determine if the application is vulnerable to SQL injection by retrieving data from other tables or databases. We obviously have Boolean based testing. This is very, very popular, for example, uh, in trying to bypass um, in, in trying to bypass login, uh, login screens or in trying to bypass authentication forms. And again, I'll show you this. So this involves manipulating the application's response based on Boolean conditions. Uh, and this will help you determine if the application is vulnerable. So for example, injecting a uh, single quote or one equals one in a login form uh, will help you bypass authentication. The reason this works is we're using a string delimiter, which is the, uh, the actual single quote. And then we're utilizing a logical operator to say that uh, you can run the previous SQL query that precedes this query. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the result is of that query. Uh, what you can do is you can also run this query. And in this case, the query is always going to be true because one is always going to be equal to one. Now, the great thing with uh, Boolean based payloads or SQL queries is this doesn't have to be one equals one. This can be, uh, for example, uh, A equals A, 100 equals 100. As long as that um, operation is always true, it will work. And in this case, this is a common way of bypassing authentication or a login screen. You then have time based testing, which is also, you know, very, very popular because in most cases, you're on most modern websites, you're typically going to see either mix of union based testing, Boolean based testing and time based testing, more so time based testing, uh, you know, even though you're not getting back the results, you can always utilize a tool like uh, uh, SQL map, which has some out of band functionality where data is returned back to you. And that's typically why people uh, or pen testers use it. So with time based testing, as I mentioned, in the SQL fundamental section of this course uh, involves injecting time, uh, time delayed SQL queries uh, in order to reveal if the application is vulnerable to time based a blind SQL injection by observing the delays in server response. So you essentially use an SQL query uh, that is uh, designed to invoke or to tell the database to delay the uh, execution of the SQL query by a certain amount of time. And then if it's successful, you're able to monitor the response time and say, okay, yeah, th so that took 30 seconds. That means it is working. And you can also utilize other, you know, SQL commands or, or uh, SQL syntax to, uh, for example, sleep after execution uh, before uh, results are returned. And again, this is something we'll be exploring as well. Um, and uh, the other one, of course, is input validation and sanitization. It's something that you need to be aware of when performing manual testing. And this involves reviewing the application's code or what is publicly accessible and checking if proper input validation and sanitization techniques are implemented. So you, you, what you want to do is look for instances where user input is directly concatenated into SQL queries without proper sanitization or prepared statements. And I'll show you an example of what good user input validation looks like uh, in the next video.
Um, as for automated testing, this is fairly simple to understand. You typically want to use tools like OWASP Zap, Burp Suite, or SQL Map, right? Because uh, in the case of OWASP Zap and Burp Suite, because they're web proxies, the process, as I said, is semi-manual or semi-automated, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you typically start using SQL Map when or after typically you have identified that yes an sql injection vulnerability exists however you may want to verify it a little bit more through the use of additional payloads but for some reason you just can't find a payload that's working sql map is your friend at that point in time now that's not to say that sql map cannot be used to identify or to tell you yes an sql injection vulnerability exists but Bug bounty hunters and pen web app pen testers typically know that, okay, something's going on here. I just need a tool like a SQL map to generate a really cool payload for me and test it and verify it and provide me with proof of verification that yes, you know, indeed there is an SQL injection vulnerability that affects this particular application input. So when it comes down to the actual manual testing process, uh, as I said, you typically want to start off uh, by using special characters. So testing an application input for SQL injection will typically involve trying to inject string terminators or string delimiters like a single or double quote, SQL commands like select union and you know other ones, SQL comments, this is very, very, very important. So you typically want to utilize the pound symbol or uh, the double hyphen to denote a comment. This is typically after your SQL query because if there is another SQL query after the injectable parameter, you need to ensure that that SQL query is not executed as well. And again, you may be a little bit confused, don't worry. I'll, I'll actually put all of this into context and everything that we learned in the SQL fundamentals video into practice or into context. Another important factor to consider when performing manual testing is whether the injectable parameter or input is string based or integer based. And one final thing to keep in mind or to take into consideration is that you should always test one injection at a time. Otherwise, you'll not be able to identify which inject uh, injection vector or payload is successful. So again, don't rush. Uh, don't rush the process, be very meticulous with what you're doing and try and understand what's going on and what payload you're using. That's really what I'm going to be trying to do in this section as well as the next section is to show you that you don't need to go crazy with payloads. You just need to understand how the web application is working and you then you know, use primarily error or blind based uh, injection to try and uh, learn more about the database and more about the web application and how the query works. Only after that, you know, can you start trying different payloads to see what uh, the extent or the severity of the vulnerability from uh, the perspective of an attacker. So I've talked about integer and string based injection. All right. Now, what do, what do I mean when I say this? This is something that is really not understood. And if you understand this, I can almost guarantee that you'll be able to look at any payload that's publicly available and you'll be able to say, OK, yeah, that will work for integer based injection. And this one will work for string based injection. It's really very simple. So in the case of integer based parameter injection, in certain cases, SQL queries will treat the injectable parameter as an integer depending on the data uh, on the actual data type. So let's say you're browsing a site and you realize that uh, within the URL, there's a uh, dynamic ID, right, as we already explored previously. And uh, this value could be set to whatever, right, it could be set to one, Regardless, the point I'm trying to make is that this is the injectable parameter. This is where you can inject your SQL uh, code or your, your SQL query or payload. In the back end, the query looks something like this. Select all from users where the ID equals. Now, the key thing I want you to note is because this is numeric, because the ID is numeric in value or in terms of its data type, it's an, an integer and can only be an integer the SQL query also passes along or infers that same sentiment in that instead of concatenating this um, injectable parameter or the value of ID in single or double quotes, it'll just pass it along, right? Or you just need to, uh, once the, the value is specified, this is passed along by the web application and that is substituted with, uh, you know, where you have fuzz here. Right, so it would be select um, all from users where the ID equals one, not concatenated or anything. So 
in such case in 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 this particular case it is recommended to utilize sql queries or payloads that utilize logical operators and ones that in in most cases you really don't need to utilize a string de delimiter like a single quote before your actual uh, sql query or your sql payload so you'll actually see that when you're exploring some public payloads that are available or you're taking a look at some cheat sheets which i'll actually show you you'll typically see that you have payloads that look like this where there is no uh, inclusion of a single um, a single quote before the actual payload uh, and then you'll see payloads like this or you'll see payloads that have that single quote and that when you see the single quote just know that those are um, string based injection payloads all right so these are integer uh, examples of integer based injection payloads where you can use and one, which you know uh, will you know pretty much tell you if there is an injection vulnerability, and zero is false. So you can run different checks. You can also run mathematical operations. So one times fifty six, for example, if it is vulnerable, it will return fifty six. If it returns one, it means that it's not vulnerable. In the case of string based injection, this is something that you may be a little bit more familiar with, uh, given that you typically see this with modern web applications. So. With string-based parameter injection, in most cases, the SQL queries will treat the injectable parameter as string. So again, going back to the same example, we have site.com, user.php, id equals Alexis, all right? So now the key thing to note is the data type. So in the previous web application example, the data type was an integer. You can obviously tell that. In this case, it probably is a string because it is a string of characters. So in this case, it's referring to a name. It could be, re be referring to a blog post. Regardless of what the, the parameter is, this is treated as a string. Now, what that means is that the SQL queries is also most likely going to be designed to treat it as a string. So we have the query here. So select all from users where the name equals fuzz and the SQL query will have that uh, encapsulated or this value encapsulated when it's passed by the web application it'll be encapsulated by single quotes. Now, the reason why in when you talk about string-based injection, the payloads have a single quote before the actual payload of the SQL query is to uh, act as a string delimiter, where you're essentially terminating this particular, um, this particular parameter and you're starting a new SQL uh, query, and then you end it typically either with the... Um, the terminator, the SQL terminator, which is a, a semicolon, or you can end it with a comment to infer or to say that, hey, after anything after this, I don't want executed. So in these cases, it's recommended to utilize special SQL uh, characters or delimiters like the single quote to delimit string literals. So, you know, single quote, you can also use double quote, uh, or rather you can use a single, single quote a double single quote, a single double quote, and a double double quote. So that may be a bit confusing, but you know, there's a single quote and a double quote, just variations of both. Now, the single quote is really important, especially when you're talking about string-based injection. Why is it important, right? This is typically known as the single quote exploit. So SQL injection vulnerabilities often arise when user supplied input is not pro properly validated, sanitized or handled within the application code. One common technique used in SQL injection attacks or in testing is the process of exploiting the single quote character. In the structured query language or in SQL, the single quote is used to delimit string literals. What does this mean? It means when a user input is directly incorporated into an SQL query without proper handling, an attacker can inject a single quote character as part of the input, which can disrupt the intended query structure and allow for the injection of malicious SQL code after the single quote. So you'll actually see this in practice, but this is an example of what it looks like. So for example, consider a login form where the username and password inputs are concatenated into an SQL query without proper validation. So it's treating it as a string, regardless of whether where the value is coming from. In this case, it's coming from the username field and the password field. 
this is what the query looks like. So select all from users where the username equals to, and then, you know, the username is put in here and password equals to, and the password is substituted in here. Now, if the application does not handle the single quote character in the input correctly, and allows for that injection, an attacker can inject a single quote to terminate the string literal into, you know, for both the username and password parameters and add their own SQL code after that. So here's an example of an, an attack payload we can use where we start off by putting in the single quote that will essentially terminate the string literal for either username or password. And then we use a logical operator like or and we provide an operation that's always going to be true. And then we can uh, we need to always end our own query with either the SQL delimiter or the comment. Um, the comments uh, characters here or the comment symbols, which can either be a double hyphen or the hash or pound symbol. So the modified query would then become the following after the injection. So it would be select all from users where the username equals to. You have the, uh, the you know, the, the actual string literal there, but that's been terminated. And what comes after is our own logical uh, operation or our own SQL query, which is a logical operation where we're saying uh, you can execute this. However, if this is not successful, you can also execute this. And in this case, this is always going to be true. And because it's always going to be true, what will happen in this particular case, it will actually dump or will allow us to bypass the authentication because the result of this entire query is going to be true. And that's what the web application is looking for, typically speaking. Now, certain web applications will look for a bit more confirmation. But in this, in the case of this query, what happens is the web application receives your input, right? So username and password, and then it knows that if it wants to verify this information, it needs to interact with the database. So in order to interact with the database, it utilizes SQL or the structured query language. In order to do that, it needs to send the database an SQL query. In this case, all the web application is asking for is, can you tell me if this username exists? And if so, is their password correct based on what you have in the users or the accounts table? So in this particular case, um, the table is called users. So the query is very simple. So select all. So we're telling the web application is telling the database. So for all the records within the users table, can you tell me or you can you confirm whether this username exists? And and, and that's a logical operator. Can you confirm that this password exists for that particular record? Now, what we're doing here is we are utilizing the single quote um, right over here. We're essentially using it. So we're delimiting, we're, if we go back to the description here, we're terminating the string literal. All right. And we're saying, okay, you, uh, you can run this first one, but that doesn't matter because you also have a second option here. So it's, remember, this is an, we're using or here instead of and. Or means that you can execute either one. And all that the web application is looking for is, you know, true or false. In this particular case, you know, we're, terminating the string literal and we're saying, okay, can you perform this operation as an alternative? In this case, the operation is always going to be true. And we use a the SQL delimiter here to terminate the SQL query and say nothing after this. Now, you don't need to use the semicolon. You can also use a comment, the comment symbol, which is power, uh, the uh, hash or pound symbol, or you can use the double, uh, the double hyphen. And what that means is anything after this right over here is not going to be executed. So in essence, the SQL query is executed by the database and it responds with true. The web application was just waiting for that confirmation. And if it's true, it just logs you in. So in this example, the single quote is injected before the payload, uh, which is single quote or one equals one. The purpose of the injected single quote is to close the string literal that encompasses the username input field. Then the attacker's injected SQL code, which is or one, uh, one equals one, causes the condition one equals one to evaluate to true, effectively bypassing the authentication mechanism. This is very common. All right. 
So I know we're covering quite a lot, but we'll put all of this into context in the next video when we're actually going through it in a lab. Now, the final thing that's very important when performing SQL injection vulnerability identification is database fingerprinting, all right? So every DBMS or database management system or every relational database management system will respond to incorrect or erroneous SQL queries with different error messages. And when you're performing identification or error-based SQL injection, this is typically what you'll be looking for to begin with. You're trying to verify whether an injection vulnerability exists. And when you use something like a single quote alone, because that will interfere with the SQL query, if it is, if one is indeed tied to the application input you're testing, different databases, or in this case, relational database management systems, will respond in their own unique way. Now, why is this important? This is important because it'll tell you, firstly, what database is running or what database is being used, right? So in this case, a typical error from Microsoft SQL database server will look like this, incorrect syntax near, and then the query snippet will be uh, added as a uh, suffix to that. Whereas a typical MySQL error will look something like this. And the reason I'm saying this is because in certain cases, the SQL queries or payloads you can use will be uh, will be dependent on the database that is running. So there's no huge changes with regards to the actual SQL uh, syntax, but other features regarding the database will be unique. So uh, this is very important information to identify. So, you know, a typical MySQL error will look uh, something like this. You'll typically see the following text to begin with. So you have an error in your SQL syntax. Can you check the manual that corresponds to your MySQL server version for the right uh, syntax to use? And then the query snippet will be added as a suffix after that, telling you where you went wrong. And I've listed within these slides uh, some common SQL injection payloads. And you know you can obviously tell that these are primarily string-based uh, string uh, SQL injection payloads. You also have uh, some integer based ones, but again, it's all about identifying whether you're dealing with uh, whether the parameter is being treated as a string or an integer. And this is something that we ac I actually showed you in the SQL fundamentals video where we were writing our own SQL queries. You saw that when I was running select all from uh, WordPress users where ID equals to one, I was putting one alone, so that means that would be treated as an integer, or I was also encapsulating it in uh, in single quotes, and that means it's treated as a string. So uh, always be cognizant of how the actual SQL query uh, used by the web application to interact with the database is constructed and how the injectable parameters are treated or are handled within that query. And uh, over here, I've also listed some database-specific SQLI payloads. So for MySQL, Microsoft SQL Database Server, Oracle, PostgreSQL, SQLite, uh, what will typically work. And I would highly recommend if you're doing, you know, for example, the using this uh, particular payload where you are able to bypass authentication or set the response of the query to true, regardless of what it does, the uh, what works at the end is typically the pound or the hash symbol here, which denotes a comment. For access, uh, for the access database, you uh, is recommended to use null characters. Now, uh, to end this video, because I know I've been going for quite a while, uh, one of the tools that I like utilizing that ties back to the OASP uh, top ten, but really the OASP security testing guide, which I've highlighted in other courses is the OASP testing checklist, right? The testing checklist is a checklist that is very useful for web application penetration te uh, testers, developers, people who work in web application security. Anyone who is doing any sort of security assessment on a web application should use this spreadsheet. And I've listed the, Git the GitHub repo to that spreadsheet. It's completely free. It has no viruses, no macros. I've checked it myself. It's official. It provides you or it sorts out vulnerabilities into different categories based on their type. And uh, it, this is not really tied to the OASP top 10 because you can see that this is under data validation testing. Uh, which would make sense. But under this, we have testing for SQL injection, where in all, uh, really all that you're required to do is identify SQL injection points, and then 
after you've identified a SQL injection vulnerability, you're supposed to assess the severity of the injection and the level of access that can be achieved through it. And the tools to use are either Burp Suite or Zap SQL Map and NoSQL Map for NoSQL databases, which I'll also highlight. I always use this as a reference when I'm performing my tests because it allows me to, to perform comprehensive testing and uh, it really is very useful. And I've also added some uh, SQL injection resources here. So this is a full, the following is a list of useful open source repositories, tools and documentation uh, that'll provide you with information and payloads that can be used for different types and subtypes of SQL injection vulnerabilities. So I have some cheat sheets. Uh, the first one is a GitHub repo with a huge collection of different types of SQL injection payloads. I definitely recommend that you take a look at that. We'll be exploring it in the next video. There's also one that was set up by Burp Suite or by Portswigger, the parent company of Burp Suite, uh, that is not as comprehensive, but sort of explains things really well. And then you obviously have the OASP web security testing guide where you can take a look at that and uh, specifically SQL injection. And it'll provide you with a uh, security testing guide or how you can go about identifying and exploiting the vulnerabilities when performing an assessment. It's sort of a best practice or a methodology to work behind. In, my, in the case of this video, I've essentially broken it all down or it's based heavily on the web, uh, the OASP web security testing guide. I'm just going to put it into practice and show you what it looks like. Uh, within, the, within this entire section. So that's quite a mouthful. We've covered quite a lot, but I'm really happy that I've gone through this before we actually did any exploitation. So now that we have this out of the way, you'll be excited to know that we're now getting started with the actual exploitation phase. So we've taken a look at one lab already uh, with the fundamentals of the structured query language. But now in the next video, we'll be taking a look at, and it'll be fully practical, how to manually find or identify SQL injection vulnerabilities. So uh, with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. Finding SQL injection vulnerabilities manually. In this video, we're going to be taking all of the manual techniques and methodologies that we had uh, learned or taken a look at in the previous video and putting them into action in a lab. So uh, as I've mentioned, this video has a lab associated with it. Uh, this lab is going to provide you with access to a deliberately vulnerable web application called OWASP Motile Day 2. Now you may be thinking to yourself, why aren't we running these tests on real world web applications? We will do that when we'll be taking a look at each of the uh, SQL injection vulnerability types and subtypes. But with regards to identification, there's a good reason why I'm using OWASP Motile Day and that'll become evident. I uh, have frequently, or I've always utilized OWASP Motile Day 2 uh, to teach students about SQL injection and uh, from my experience, this has been one of the most important lessons and labs that uh, students have gone through because it clarifies a lot of their questions with regards to identification or the process of identific uh, identifying SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, one thing to note as well is that when you start this lab, uh, it'll provide you with a link, a public link accessible on the internet to the uh, or to your instant, uh, your, your instance of the OASP Motile Day 2 uh, deliberately vulnerable web application, uh, you will not be provided with your own Kali Linux system. So, uh, in this in this particular video, we'll not be utilizing Kali Linux, but I'll be accessing the uh, I'll be accessing Motile Day 2 from my own Kali Linux VM. So just keep that in mind. In the next video, we'll be using the same lab but we'll be exploring the process with Zap. So you'll also need your own Kali Linux system for that with Zap installed. If you're not aware of how to do that, you can check out the Web Proxies course if you haven't already. But again, these ones will not have any Kali Linux system. So I'll be walking through what uh, you need to do on your own Kali box, which I, I think a lot of you prefer. Uh, with that being said, we have got a lot to cover and I'll be covering things uh, sequentially in a way that will make sense. So I'm going to switch over to my Kali VM and I'm going to fire up the lab and we can get started. You're free to go through the lab beforehand and uh, test out the SQL injection of vulnerability exercises, or you can watch the video and then go through it yourself. Uh, either way, whatever works for you. So 
um, I am going to switch over and uh, we'll get started. So I'll see you there. All right, so I'm back within my Kali VM and I've uh, launched the lab and it's provided me with this URL. In your case, your URL might be different. However, don't worry about that. Everything will still apply. Uh, now, before we get started in the previous video, I'd mentioned one of the GitHub repositories that uh, is called SQL injection payload list. It's uh, essentially a free uh, set of SQL injection payloads. Uh, for the various types or subtypes of SQL injection uh, techniques. So uh, right over here, you have a generic SQL injection payloads. The only issue with this particular repository is, is uh, no explanation has been given as to what they're used for, but they're sorted at a high level in that we have error-based payloads here that can be used either for integer-based uh, injection or string-based injection. Uh, and you can see there's uh, inclusion of, uh, you know, Boolean operations. Uh, there's also inclusion of, uh, if we take a look at it here, uh, there's also uh, the inclusion of uh, other categories. So for example, generic time-based SQL injection payloads for blind injection, where you can utilize, uh, you know, time-based operation or time-based injection to verify that, uh, you know, injection is indeed possible or not. Uh, the same, I believe we also have uh, union uh, payloads right over here. So we'll be referencing this uh, at certain points in time, although I'm going to be really focusing on the uh, detection or identification technique. So the reason why I love OWASP Motilidae is, is for two reasons. Number one, I can control the security level and I'll be increasing the security level to the highest to show you what input sanitization or input validation looks like. But for now, we're going to keep it at security level zero, which uh, assumes or means that the uh, all application inputs uh, do not have any input validation, which is a good thing. Uh, so that's the first thing I like. The second thing I like is that regardless of the SQL injection technique you are utilizing, specifically in the case of error-based injection, even with others, if there is a mistake in your SQL payload or your syntax, an error will be displayed. So again, it's not tied to the payload you're using or the type of uh, SQL injection vulnerability you're exploiting. It's just displayed for students and you know uh, for instructors really uh, to essentially show you what's going on in the background, what query is being used, and that'll help you understand what payloads to use. So to get started, what we're going to start off with is uh, the login, um, the login form right over here. So we're currently not logged in, as you can see here. And I'm going to click on login. And uh, over here, we have a simple login form, right? And uh, at the moment, uh, as I said, security level is set to zero. So the first thing you need to do or you can do manually, obviously, is try and view the um, the actual source code of the web page to try and see if uh, there is a link to the actual uh, login.php uh, script or login.php page, if, uh, as it were, that handles. Uh, there we are. So we can see it here. So, you know, we can uh, probably try and open this in a new tab just to see whether we can explore what's going on with regards to the query. But that's really not important at this point in time. We can just, uh, you know, pass in simple test username and password and you can see account doesn't exist. So the first thing that we need to do or that is recommended is obviously the single quote, right? So if we take a look at the URL, you can see that once when we submit uh, the value for the parameters username and password, they are not passed in the URL at all. All right, so that means uh, we would they are being passed in the HTTP request. We don't really need to analyze the request with a web proxy just yet, uh, but we can start off by doing some you know simple enumeration or simple testing, so error based testing where we use a single quote, uh, and that is going to uh, essentially act as a delimiter. For um, uh, and you know, after this point, we can start putting our own payloads. But this is going to terminate the string literal. So this is the cool thing with Motilidae. So if I just hit login here, so this is error-based injection, and indeed an error is displayed. Now remember, when we're talking about database enumeration, if we take a look at the error message here. What you'll typically see in a real world web application that is vulnerable to error based injection, if we used the single quote, you would see an error like this saying you have an error in your SQL syntax. And you can again verify this by taking a look at the slides. 
this tells us that we're dealing with a MySQL database, all right? And that is also highlighted here where it says, check the manual that corresponds to your MySQL server version for the right syntax to use near uh, the following at line one. And then the great thing with uh, Mutilla Day is it shows you the query that is being used by the web application to send data to the database for processing and where you went wrong. So in this case, this terminates the string literal, the quote that we specified, and that's obviously a syntax error. And as a result, we get an error. Now, what this tells us is our query or this particular application input is not being sanitized because we're able to pass in special characters like quotes or single quotes as it were and this is being processed by the database and the database can process it because it doesn't understand what you mean when you specify another single quote and you don't close it or you try and encapsulate any info within it so the point i'm making here is what we can try and do now is we can try and utilize a uh, boolean uh, operation to bypass the authentication uh, or bypass the login screen. Now, this is a trick that has been known for quite a while um, on web applications or on login forms that don't have any input validation. And that is to utilize the uh, single quote there. And obviously, in this case, again, if we take a look at the query, and this is one thing that I wanted to point out, we can see the double single quotes here. Where the username where the username would be encapsulated and that tells us what if you go back to the slides in the previous video it tells us that this is string right so this uh, the parameter the username parameter is treated as a string so that means we would always need to use a single quote if we tried to you know perform just um we can say and uh you know without any single quote and we hit enter that would not be processed by the database right or would not be handled as a legit it would essentially be passed uh, within the single quotes and obviously that user doesn't exist so what we could do is say zero or uh, sorry um single quote or one equals one so an operation that's always true if we hit enter we are going to get an error so i'll hit login and what's the error well firstly we have an uh, an error in our uh, in our syntax right but if we take a look at the query we can say it says select from the column username from the uh, table called accounts where the username equals two and what we did with the string uh, with the single quote as you can see we have uh, essentially you know, uh, it's terminated the string literal and now uh, what we have done here is we are putting in our payload in here all right and that's why it's you know open closed etc uh, so this is open and closed here, whereas previ uh, previously that was not the case. So the purpose of the single quote is to, uh, again, uh, close the string literal that encompasses the username input field or the, you know, the actual uh, parameter. Then uh, whatever we specify afterwards is the injected payload, and that's what will be uh, executed. So in this case, what's the issue? Well, the issue is if we take a look at the query, um, What's happening here is this statement is being terminated, all right? So that means that in this particular case, we need, would need to add a comment here. Now, there are two ways of adding a comment. So we can use the, dub, the double hyphen, login. Uh, that doesn't work. So we can say a uh, single quote or one equals one, and then the hash or pound symbol, and we hit enter. And that will be equals to true or that operation will always be true. And as a result, we, uh, that is sent back to the web application and the web application thinks that, yes, this user is logged in and we're logged in as the user admin right over here. All right. So that is how to bypass a simple um, authentication or login form um, that has no input uh, validation or uh, user input validation or sanitization. All right, so that's the first um, the first example that I always like using when I'm whenever I'm teaching this topic. So again, you can always refer back to this GitHub repo, and uh, you can use either one of them. So for example, you can also change the one equals one to whatever you want. As I said, the difference between um, and this is something that you need to test. Uh, the uh, you you need to essentially go through a testing process where where you essentially try and uh, verify what is being treated as a comment because in certain cases the double hyphen if that is being um, is being sanitized by the web application that might not be possible to inject so you always need to try the uh, 
uh, the pound or the hash symbol um, if you're trying to invoke a, uh, a comment, right? Or to terminate at that point and not execute anything after. So um, we can also try and use other SQL uh, commands here, like having one equals one. So if this, of course, was integer based and we would just put that in there, then that would work. But in this case, you would need to obviously use uh, the single quote. It's going to terminate the string literal. So I'll hit enter. And in this case, that doesn't work. All right. So the reason that's not working in the case of, you know, bypassing a login is obviously down to the uh, logical operator being used. Now, if we used and, uh, I don't think that would work as well. So we can say and one equals one and we can hit enter. Yes. And that doesn't work. So this all depends on the initial query here where obviously when we put in the string, uh, the single quote that's essentially terminates the string literal and then anything after that is uh, going to be executed. So uh, what we're doing now is um, the reason we use the logical operator, as I said, is we need something that will always result uh, in true or will always be true. And therefore, you know, in this case bypasses the login. Now, what we can do is let's take a look at some of the injection exercises by navigating to OWASP and I'll just go home here for a second OWASP 2017 and we want to take a look at A1 injection which is SQL injection and there's multiple exercises there's extract data via user info so these are just examples of application inputs that you are likely to experience or likely to come by and the login one we've already taken a look at uh, you know, we've explored error based and then obviously we have utilized uh, some uh, a Boolean operation to bypass the login. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, insert injection, but we'll not be exploring this because this is not really uh, is not really commonly found. But we also have blind SQL injection via timing and SQL map, uh, map practice. And I'll go through them as I would, you know, if I was um, explaining this uh, to students, uh, which is exactly what I'm doing. So we'll go to extract data and user info. And uh, this is slightly different because uh, this particular input uh, essentially performs a user lookup, right? So for example, what I would need to do is put in a name and a password, right? And if the account exists, it'll display that user's information. Okay, so if I say, you know, for example, Alexis and password, and let's see if I have a user account, I don't because I haven't registered, it's going to tell us right over here, bad username or password. So with Motility, the great thing, as I've said, is we can use the single quote there to obviously uh, invoke an error, right? So error based injection. And in this case, the error tells us, um, you know, it provides us with the error, which tells us exactly what we kn we knew. Um, but really what I'm focused on here is the query. So this is a slightly different query. We're not selecting a particular column within the table accounts. We're selecting everything from accounts where the username and password. So we're now matching the username and password, which means, and this is very important, uh, you need to take into, con and this is where the comments come into play, uh, you need to be uh, cognizant of what is being executed after the query that is executed after. Okay, so let me show you something here. In the username, I'll pass in the single quote and the password, I'll pass in the password here. So I'll pass that through and now you can see how things or how information is being passed in. All right, so what happens is when we inject or when we use the single quote, you can obviously tell how it's being injected, right? Now, what happens and this is something I should have done on the login screen. What if we um, say what, or a uh, single quote or equals, and then we put the integers uh, or encapsulate them in quotes, right? And we'll not use a comment and we'll put in a value for password just to take a look at what's been sent via the query. So in this particular case, you can see what's happened, right? When you talk about string based injection, when we put the single quote, what it does is it injects it in there and then after that is where we put uh, the query that we want injected, sort of replacing it, but it terminates the string literal for the username parameter. And you can see the closed quote there. Now, when we, um, in this particular case, when we say one or one equals one, and we use a comment and we'll put in a password and let's see what happened here. 
or what happens, the SQL injection is successful. So I we don't even need to put in a value for the password, but what happens here is this is set to true. So going back to the actual query, if we just take a look at it, when we utilize that Boolean operation or that Boolean payload, uh, it's essentially going to display everything. So select all from accounts. So every uh, record in accounts and all the columns or all the attributes for all of the records. And in this case, we are using the uh, the Boolean or logical operator or to say where, you know, uh, if this is true, and in, in this case, we're using an operation that's always going to be true, then display all of that. And that's exactly what the web application required. And we're using a comment to get rid of the actual um, of this particular the, the second query that checks or tries to match the password. So if I say um, one or one, uh, so I'll use single quote or one, and then I'll use the pound symbol there. And I put in the password, I just want to show you that this comment here, the pound symbol will make anything after it a comment. In this case, it worked. Um, and that's because we're just saying or one, right, which which also works. If we take a look at the payload here, or the payload list here, that should also work We say one equals zero. Yeah, so pretty much the same thing. But typically, you want to use an operation that is always correct, right. So we can say again, in this case, one, um, or one, uh, sorry, in this case, uh, that's going to be or one equals one. And I'll just uh, put a comment there and we can hit view account details. And again, as I said, that's going to display all the records within that particular table. And in this case, we're able to enumerate the username, password and signature and the passwords are not uh, encrypted. So we can now use these credentials to log in. And this is an example of, uh, you know, error based SQL injection. Um, and the key thing that I wanted to highlight there was how uh, the query itself and the way it treats the parameters will affect the payload that you use. Now we'll try others, of course, but one thing that I want to highlight here before we actually proceed is uh, going to be um, obviously the URL parameters because we haven't, I really didn't show you that, but um, if we just perform a quick test here, I'm just going to go back home and we go into user info by default, nothing is being specified in the URL. However, if we say test and test, uh, we'll, we, we hit uh, view account details. Now we can see that that is being sent via the URL. What that means is that we don't need to perform the injection via the input form. It's uh, just a small difference, uh, but we can say right over here in the username, the value of the username parameter, we can perform our injection in there. So we say single quote um, to perform some error based injection and we get that error there. So username, we can then append to this and say, uh, or uh, one equals one, hit enter and the injection is done. In this case, doesn't look like it's done successfully. Uh, error one equals one, so that's username or one equals one. This is where we now have URL encoding. So we hit enter. And in this case, looks like we're getting a bit of an error. So that is set up successfully. Um, let us try and use the pound symbol. And excellent. So this brings me to my next point. So that's not working via the URL. So in this case, what I'll do is I will uh, copy this URL here and we are going to open up Burp Suite. So you don't need to do this, but I'm just showing you as an example and we'll use both Burp and Zap throughout this course uh, just to show you that I'm not biased either way. But there is some functionality that we'll be exploring in the next video that is available only in OASP Zap. In Burp, it is available in Burp, but in the trial version and you need a license. So. I'll go into the proxy and I'll open up the burp browser so I can do everything from within here and I'll just open that in there and I'll just turn off intercept and we'll go back in here into the into OS Motility. I'm just going through this with my proxy and we'll go into injection and user info. All right, so now um, we'll just put in some test parameters here. So again, user lookup test and test. I'll go into burp suite and turn on intercept so we can intercept the uh, what appears to be a get request, but it could be a post. Let's hit submit. So it is a get request. So it's being sent via the URL or as URL parameters. Now, 
What I was trying to point out is that when you're doing URL based injection specifically, and this you may run into this where the input is not available via the actual web application or in the form of an application input form, like username, password and stuff like that. If I say, you know, or one equals one, and uh, let's see if this works. I just want to show you something really cool here. So that's not working. I forwarded the request, it's not working. So let's try and see what this issue is. So again, I'll just resubmit some test uh, values here. And now I'll get rid of that and I'll say, or one equals one, same thing. The only thing I need to do now is URL encode it. So I'll highlight my payload, including the single quote, and I'll use control U on my keyboard to encode this. It's called URL encoding because URLs uh, cannot process certain characters, special characters. So if we forward this now, uh, there we are. So it looks like we have an error. I encoded it a little bit too much. So let's try this again. Um, say test and test. And this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, sorry, not on uh, on Firefox rather, but uh, in the Burp Suite browser here, which is Chromium. So I'll say view account details. What happens if we append to the actual username and I say, uh, you know, or one equals one and I submit this. So I'll forward this here. Nothing yet. All right. So let's perform the, these tests a little bit more. So we'll resubmit that again get rid of tests or test rather and say or uh, in this particular case yeah we'll just say or one equals one and uh, there's a good reason i'm doing this so you'll actually see this shortly so now i just again highlight that and say one time url and code for that there there we are so this is something that's very important because as i said coming back to the inception of the problem what if this particular um, this particular page did not have any input form where you can inject stuff directly via the form and have the, have the the web application set up the URL for you and the parameters were in the URL themselves? So, so you know, sort of like when you have the index.php page equals or ID equals one. The injection needs to be done via the URL and your best friend here is always going to be a web proxy like um, like Burp Suite or OWASP Zap. All right. So that's, uh, you know, URL based testing or injection. Always keep that in mind. Never, ever ignore the URL, right? Because parameters could be uh, being passed via the URL and are not you're not able to make the injection via an input a form or a field like so. Now, just to show you again what this would look like and that the web application does it for you automatically. If I say, uh, sorry, um, single quote or one equals one, the same thing pretty much. And I uh, submit that if I go back to this here, um, let's see if I go back here and I forward this, you can see that that is done automatically. So it's URL encoded. As I said, you can do that very easily. Uh, with Burp Suite by just highlighting and using the con uh, control U keys on your keyboard, or you can always uh, copy whatever you want to encode like this here. And uh, you navigate into Burp Suite and you go into the decoder and paste in that there. And then you can say encode, perform URL encoding, and that'll perform some extreme encoding for you, which may not always work. Cause remember when I encoded it twice, the web application for some reason did not handle it well. So again, manual testing is always awesome and is really, really cool for this reason. And uh, you know, this is not the, the only reason alone, but you get the idea. So I'll forward that there and uh, that injection was successful. Now, what happens when the application does not have an input form that allows you to directly perform the injection and you can't see any parameters within the actual URL where you can perform the injection directly there. Well, again, in this particular case, you need to rely on a web proxy like Burp Suite. So I'll go into OASP 2017. And what we want to take a look at is under SQL map, uh, SQL map practice, you want to take a look at the exercise, view someone's blog. All right, so I'll just uh, turn off intercept temporarily there.
Now, the way this works, as you can see, is it allows you to view the blog entries or the blogs for a particular user on this web application. So for example, I can show all entries right over here. Pay attention to the URL. So no parameter is being specified. So when I specified the user admin, typically with if this was being passed in the URL, or, you know, we had a parameter, an injectable parameter, you typically see, you know, view someone's blog.php, question mark, uh, something like this, ID equals to Alexis or admin or something like that, or maybe something like name or author. So if I say um, author equals admin, let's see if that works. All right, so that doesn't work. All right, so you get the idea you will obviously be dealing with these types of um, application inputs. Now, why am I saying the application inputs? The application inputs because we're allowed to make the selection manually. Uh, and obviously this data is being sent to the web application and obviously it's being, it's interacting with the database. The reason it's interacting with the database is because obviously, firstly, in the case of Motility, if we just chose um, you know, an author at random here, you can see the way the data is being displayed is in a tabular format, but we also, you can tell just given its nature that this info is being stored in a database because a comment is a is typically stored in a different column or even in a different table. Usernames is probably being referenced in the, in the accounts table. You get the idea. So what you need to do now is op go into your um, web proxy and you want to go in here and we'll just choose a random user and we'll click view blog entries. Now, you can see that we have nothing in the URL and what I'll do here is uh, let me navigate into options um, and uh, actually hold on uh, intercept. What we want to do is take a look at uh, settings and uh, what user interface so display uh, the appearance font size let me just increase that there that's going to change the overall font size which is not what i want but if we go into proxy intercept uh, we should have settings here but that's the main settings if i go into message editor there we are i'll increase that slightly so you can see that there you can actually see the HTTP request. In this case, it is a post request, which means it's sending data. All right. No parameters in the URL. If we take a look at the cookie, we just have a PHP session ID there. However, in the body of the HTTP request, we can see that, that those parameters are being sent. The point I'm making is it's still being sent in the request, in this case, a post request. However, it's being sent in the body, which means it's, never, it's not going to be visible either in the URL as a parameter or the injection uh, cannot be performed uh, manually via an application input. Of course, it's being done through a sort of a manual system where it shows you the list of users uh, that you can, you know, you can actually view the blog posts for. But the point I'm making is this is being sent in the body of the request. So if you take a look at the, the inspector to your right here, you can see you have the request body parameters where we have author John and then view someone's blog. So obviously I'm assuming this is going to be the injectable parameter. So what we do now is there's two things we can do. We can do the testing by modifying requests as we send them, or we can send them to the repeater, which I'll do. However, let's try and use the single quote there just to see what comes up. So I'll forward that there. And there we are. So error-based injection, we can see it displays the MySQL error here, and it also displays the query, and the query proves my point. So in this case, it's uh, selecting all from the uh, column blogs table. Uh, sorry, it's selecting all from the table called blogs table, where the blogger name or the column uh, or attribute like and here we have the wildcard and it's ordered in this particular case by date, descending limit zero to hundred, all right? So very simple query. This is the injectable point here because there's, no there's no other parameter within this query, right? So what can we do here? Well, again, we can just put in our simple or the same 
uh, that we can just put in the same uh, SQL payload that we're using the boolean, uh, the boolean one. So I will uh, just choose another one here and just submit that, and I'll go in here, and we can now say one. Uh, sorry, or one equals one. Use the comment there. We may need to URL encode. The better way of testing this is to send it to the repeater, where we can modify the requests and view the responses on the fly, and also render the responses. So I'll now send this. And let's take a look at the response. In this particular case, we have a lot, so we're better off rendering it to see what the response was. And there we are. So what this does is it displays uh, the blog posts for all the users. Now, this is something that was, uh, was possible beforehand because if I go into Firefox, actually, let's just go back into Zap here, uh, sorry, into the Burp Suite browser we can show all, which will probably just display the same. So this is not really a cool SQL injection, but, but we have verified that SQL injection is possible. So this is still pretty cool in that we've been able to dump all of this for all the users. Uh, what we can probably do here, because this is probably going to be blind in most cases, even though in this case it's not, we can try and perform some blind um, SQL injection, or we can try some union payloads, right? So uh, what we'll do here is we'll get rid of this here. And we can try a union payload like, uh, for example, a union select, and I'll show you where you can find them. They're still on that GitHub repo, we can say null, 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 null. And uh, let's use a comment and let's send that there. Let's view the response. Let's see what that looks like. So in this case, uh, it looks like that is working. If we go back into Firefox and take a look at some payloads here for union, uh, and we'll also talk about time-based injection, which is still blind, but I just want to show you how this would work. So these are these all tests to show you that it does indeed work. So uh, for example, um, we can get it to Let's see one that is potentially interesting. So we don't want sleep yet, but uh, that I know will cause the database to crash. But uh, for example, uh, let's see, I don't want anything sleep, but yeah, we can try, you know, union select and this very large one here, just to see what happens. Again, this is all about testing. So we'll uh, paste that in there. So union select, uh, union all select and then we use the we'll use the pound symbol because that seems to be working in this case and let's see what the response is here and in this case we have an error so we've invoked an error of sorts um, if we take a look at this here uh, actually we can display that entire message there but uh, you get the idea um, if we go back and uh, let's try and use this payload here so union and select sorry union all select my bad and uh, we go in here and let's just replace that there of course we can also test the double hyphen but i doubt that will work so let's see what the response is like here so we still get an error if we take a look at the query uh, select all from blogs table where blogger name uh, is like uh, blogger name like or similar to and we have the injection there so union all select one two three what we can also do to sort of verify this is um, this is selecting all so what we can do is uh, try and perform some tests where we can say union um, select all And we'll use sort of a similar one. So from blogs table, where sorry, um, where the blogger name is uh, that's the column. The blogger name Uh, where blogger name is equal to, and in here we could put uh, sort of a match like, um, for example, uh, admin. And then let's end that with a comment. So we're just trying to 
combine that so we're going to say union instead of all we're just going to say union select so union as you know allows you to combine two select statements so we'll send that over let's see what the response is like and uh, there we are so that actually works uh, the reason that worked is firstly we have the initial query right and uh, what we're doing is we're just appending there and we're saying union select from uh, blogs table where the blogger name is admin let's see if this works uh, we'll go back in here and let's see some other users like uh, bryce for example just to prove that this is indeed working so and i'll explain what's going on if it's not clear already in this particular case where the blogger name is equal to bryce uh, if we go back in here if we take a look at the query where the name is like uh, in this case there is no match because that's where we're making the injection uh, but if this was pointing or was equal to another username so for example i can give you this this will probably be an error where we can say so admin let's just try this this is very interesting to see what comes up here so there we are that still brings us admin but not bryce uh, if i change this to bryce That'll just bring up Bryce. Actually, it doesn't bring up anything there, which is uh, very, very interesting. That may be being passed differently, but you get the idea. So union select all from. Um, and the reason we're using all is because the number of columns need to match. Now, if there's another table that has three columns, we can probably do that. So select all from, uh, I believe, accounts where the blogger name where the uh, actually we don't actually need to specify where there so we'll just say all from accounts let's see if that works if we get an error it'll still confirm what i'm saying here so there we are the use select statements have a different number of columns so let's try and verify this if we go back in here uh, into firefox and i'll just say on the login form one equals one the reason i'm doing that will be apparent shortly so uh, actually hold on let me just uh, log out apologies and we will go into the user info and we will just use that payload there so in this case that the name of the table is uh, select all from accounts where username is um, username and password yeah so it's getting all so we just need to say where the username is admin or try and find a match there so just to show you that this can work uh, union select uh, all from accounts um, where the username is equal to admin trying to see if we can get that there the number of columns will match and uh, for some reason we have uh, something very interesting going on here let's try and url encode that just to see whether that corrects the white space issue okay yeah, so that is working as expected however the used uh, select statements have a different number of columns which is interesting because this one only has actually four columns so um what we can do we can modify the original one but uh we can just i'll uh, just unencode that so union select um all from or rather in this case uh this would be three yeah so that would not work ideally but you get the idea you're able to combine the results of two different tables in this case the, they don't match uh, the reason they don't match is uh, simple in this case if i listed or use this payload here this is the look, user lookup uh, you can see that there are three columns so username password signature and then i think for this one uh, right over here if we perform the uh, the actual injection or we try and view the blog entries here i'm just going to go into the proxy and forward that there and forward that there if we go back in here you can see it's uh, one two three but looks like we have the key displayed that should actually work so we go into the repeater just going to try this one more time and then we have a uh, few other examples like time-based that we'll test out as well
uh, but we're covering a lot of stuff here. So union uh, select all from accounts where the username equals admin. Uh, we don't actually need to have that particular match there. So just from accounts and uh, we'll send this. Let's see what there is. I know it's still going to tell me that mm, the columns don't match. Yeah, so different number of columns. So if we could modify the initial one, then that would work as well. But you get the idea. So that's union based injection at a high level. In this case, there's no real good. Uh, there's not really a good example I can use to showcase that. Uh, I'm just going to disable the proxy. And uh, there's a couple of others that I wanted to try out and that being time based. Um, so we can try out the time based option um, using the same uh, using the same exercise here. So I'll just say admin view blog entries and the injection point is here. So one thing that uh, we want to do is we can't really monitor the response time. So I'll just do that again view blog entries and we'll send this to the repeater because this is the only place we will be able to monitor this. So this is where we can take a look at some of those time based payloads. So um, a good example of this is uh, this option here or sleep. However, in the case of uh, motility day, given how it's set up, this might cause an issue. But what we can do is I'll just go back into my proxy here and uh, we'll just disable intercept there. If we go into the injection and blind SQL injection via timing, uh, we can use user info as an example. And uh, actually what I'll do is I'll go into the repeater and clear out these previous ones here that we had sent. And now in the proxy, we'll just turn on intercept and I'll just send in some test data here. And this is this is injected also via the URL, but we'll just do it with um, we'll just do it with burp. So we'll go into the repeater and uh, we know that the username is injectable here. So we can put one of these uh, payloads, sorry, uh, right over here. So, you know, for example, single quote or sleep um, for five seconds. So this will tell it to sleep for five seconds. And I've uh, sort of explained this here. Uh, where we can specify a delay on this website. I'm just using it uh, to give you guidance here in case it's not clear. Uh, but there's two options. You can specify a delay. Uh, so in the using the delay option, the value is formatted as follows and uh, you typically use it. Uh, so to specify a time delay, use the delay argument followed by the um, time to wait, time to sleep. The delay time can be 24 hours. This delays the execution. So I usually prefer that, not the sleep option. So the one we can test here that I'm sure uh, will probably work. Uh, we can also use the benchmark option. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can try the uh, one or PG sleep, but that's uh, obviously not going to work in this case. We're dealing with MySQL. Uh, let us try this one here. Um, wait for delay. So five seconds. This will need a web proxy. It will require a bit of testing. So we will just put it in here as it is. So wait for delay and uh, we'll use the pound symbol there. So let's send it and I want you to pay attention to the response time. So 14, uh, 492 milliseconds. Five seconds is 5000 milliseconds. So in this case, this payload is not working. So using that time based uh, injection, if this was blind, uh, we would be able to obviously tell whether it was indeed working, right? So what we want to do is again, same thing in here. Um, uh, let's see, wait for in this particular case, that doesn't seem like it was uh, specified correctly here. That's interesting. So PHP username equal to, and uh, for some reason, let me just uh, reverse that here. Uh, let us try and URL encode this. Okay, and let us send that there. Same thing, 480 milliseconds, nothing changed. All right, so it looks like this payload does not work. So maybe we can try modifying it a little bit. So uh, one thing we can try modifying here is uh, the escape characters. I know we don't need these here, so we can just say wait for delay. Let's send that over. So this was even faster. 
and uh, we will uh, just say wait for uh, delay and uh, we will essentially URL encode it there. Let's send this over, same thing. So in this case, uh, we will need to try a different payload and now you can start to see how useful this is. Uh, the sleep option will work, but it will cause a crash uh, as you will see here. So I'll actually do it just to show you that it does indeed work. And we'll go back into the repeater and uh, right over here, just going to paste in our payload. So or sleep, uh, so that's using the or operator there and that should work. So that's going to take actually, uh, looks like it injected successfully. That's very interesting. Uh, let me go ahead here and send this again to the repeater and we'll send it again this time because sometimes that happens. So or uh, sleep, uh, for five seconds and uh, let's send that over. In this case, 515 milliseconds, uh, that doesn't seem to work and the get request seems to change even though it's get here. Um, so what we can try and do here is let's try and perform the injection here. Okay, not within the repeater. So we'll say or sleep uh, five seconds and uh, we can just send that over. And in this case, it looks like it was sent over without any issues. So let me just turn off the intercept here and it will do the same thing. So or uh, sleep um, five seconds and we'll view the account details. All right, so now it's working. It looks like that needs to be, uh, yeah, so that's not passed by the URL. It's uh, being passed server side and it's taking longer than five seconds. The reason that is the case is because it's waiting until the next select statement. So the point is, if we change this to something like Alexis, that would still not work. What we would need to do is let's see if we can access this via um, same thing, user lookup via Firefox, another session that should work. So now if we check back here, once we make another check here, so I'll say test and test, that should work then. So I go back in here, um, that made the select statement, so it's still sleeping. However, if I tried to go home, would that still work or that's still tied here? So yeah, that's still tied to this particular session. Uh, so if I go back into Firefox, so, uh, you know, sort of using another user here and I hit login, actually we're using a different one. So blind SQL user info, there we are, perform this here. There we go, if we go back in here, that should be good. So view the account details. Yeah, so I think it's caused an issue with this particular session, even though I know that intercept is set, but there we are. We know it's working because uh, for this particular select, it is uh, obviously taken more than five seconds, but it has been executed successfully. Um, we can also try a few others and then we'll wrap up this session here. Uh, what we can do is uh, the other payload that you can try and run is the ability uh, to run a benchmark. So the one specifically I wanted to show you here was this one uh, right over here. Um, let's see, um, let's try and run. We can run a benchmark that usually takes time and that will prove it definitively almost. So we can run this one here and uh, we'll just go back in here. And this for some reason is still loading. I think if we were to duplicate that and uh, sort of clear our cookies, no cookies here. Um, let's see, cookies in use. Let's remove all of them done and let's refresh this up. There we are, so now it's working. So yeah, it's tied to each unique select request, which is why the time delay, we know it's working, but in this case, we'll just try it again. Uh, injection via timing and user info, and uh, we'll just paste in that payload that I just copied over. Uh, and this will take a few seconds, hold on, that uh, order by one sleep uh, benchmark, that should work. Although the reason why it may not be working,
is fairly simple. The reason it may not be working is because of the fact we need we may need to play around with the URL. So I'll just say test and uh, we'll put it in here what we just copied. And I uh, just want to go back in here, put the single quote there. And then we would need to URL encode this. Um, and then we hit forward. And uh, yeah, so in this case, that doesn't look like it's working. So order by one sleep five benchmark, the benchmark should work in and of itself. I'm just trying to find that original one here without the sleep option. Um, yeah, so there we are the all benchmark option, this should work. So if we go back in here, and I'll just uh, make another request, there we are. And I'll paste this in here. So or and then we put in the that there. You can see that took a while. Um, I'm just going to make another request here, send this to the repeater, just want to verify just to see what happens. So if we send a typical request, the response is around 500 milliseconds. Um, and then in here, we can say, put that in there. So we can increase this to something like, you know, let's increase that number just to see this change. And uh, let's put in this pound symbol there. In this case, that was actually faster. Uh, let's send uh, this back here. And let's try and URL encode this. So URL encode, uh, this actually might be more applicable to the blind injection there. So the one that we had actually previously run, let's actually try that out. So I'm just going to go in here. And uh, even though we'll be covering time based, uh, there is I know that this does indeed work It's just the correct exercise. So view someone's blog. Um, I know that that particular payload should indeed work. So we'll just say intercept, view the blog entries there. And we'll send this to the repeater. In the repeater, we will just see what the response time is like. So what we were expecting pretty much. And uh, here we have quite a large one because we had selected everything. And uh, in this particular case, all we would need to do is just add the single quote there. And let's try it without this. So I'm just going to copy this in case I require it. There we are, because this usually changes the request sometimes or the order. That took a bit of time. Let's add the comment there. Send that over. There we are. Fantastic. So this actually shows the time based injection in that we've performed a calculation is not limited to just delays or sleep times. But uh, actually, this is taking quite a while. Um, benchmark, that was quite a large benchmark. So we'll see what, uh, how long this takes. There we are. So 20,953 milliseconds, let's try reduce this to maybe um, we will just reduce it by one zero there or actually hold on. We'll just say change this to something like 50, one, two, three, three, there we are, let's send that. So that's the original one was 20 or third, uh, pretty much 21,000 milliseconds. Uh, in this particular case looks like now uh, that is not working. Um, let's increase that by quite a margin there. We may also have an issue with the cookies. But yeah, that seems to be working. So this confirms that the injection is successful, even though the output is not really tied to the payload or vice versa. So yeah, uh, that is how to identify SQL injection vulnerabilities manually. And that concludes the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so that was a quite a lot of manual testing, hopefully you've learned a lot. I really like using OWASP Motilidae. Uh, now that we've taken a look at how to identify these vulnerabilities manually, and this will come in handy when we'll be exploring uh, these vulnerabilities in real world web applications. Uh, and uh, now I want to turn the, our attention to, you know, how we can semi automate this process with a tool or a proxy like uh, OWASP Zap. So that's what we'll be doing in the next video. So uh, with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video.
finding SQL injection vulnerabilities with OWASP Zap. So now that we've taken a look at uh, how t uh, timely and uh, tedious the process of identifying SQL injection vulnerabilities can be when you do it manually, I'm going to show you some, you know, I'm essentially going to show you how you can streamline that process through the use of a tool or a web proxy like OWASP Zap. Specifically, it's fuzzing functionality and the fuzzing payloads that it has. Now, this is something that can also be done with Burp Suite, uh, but it really is extremely powerful with Zap. Uh, I'm not going to be focusing on the vulnerability scanning side of things because that has been known to be unreliable and you should never rely on vulnerability scanners to identify uh, vulnerabilities, more so uh, specifically in the case of web applications. So we'll be utilizing the same lab we used in the previous video, which means you'll be provided with a uh, a link or access to a deliberately vulnerable web application called uh, OWASP Motilla Day 2. Again, this is just showing you the techniques. We'll then put everything we've seen into action or into play in the next section we'll, when we'll get started, uh, you know, exploiting in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities. So um, again, in this particular case, you will need to have your own Kali Linux box with OWASP Zap installed, as I've said. Uh, this info can be found on uh, or within the uh, the web proxies course within this learning path. So I highly recommend you go through it because I'm not going to be covering the process of using OWASP Zap. Uh, we're really focused primarily on how to fuzz specific parameters for SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to switch over into my own Kali Linux VM and start up the lab. You're free to go through this beforehand if you're familiar with Zap. Uh, or you can go through it, uh, you know, after you've watched this video. So I'll see you uh, in the lab environment. So see you there. All right, so I am back uh, within my Kali Linux VM. And uh, as you can see, what I'm going to do is I have Zap right over here. I'm just going to start it up because I'm going to be uh, accessing the site, uh, which the lab should have provided you uh, with. I'm going to access it directly from Zap's browser which is just a modified version of Firefox, but it you know saves me from having to configure my proxy, etc. So I'll just click on the Firefox icon here. And this is, uh, I've sort of made a zap dark and uh, hopefully that doesn't affect anything, but there we are, I've just pasted in the link to OS Motilla Day 2 and I'll open it up here. And there we are. Now, as I said, there's multiple ways you can go about uh, scanning for SQL injection vulnerabilities with zap the first obviously is to you know you can right click on the site itself and in this particular case uh if we take a look at it here uh what's the difference between these ones uh, it looks like it's slightly different uh yeah so that's https so you can right click and you can include this in your default context and then perform a quick um what is recommended is to perform a spider uh, and then to perform an active scan. Now, the problem with this is this is what a typical vulnerability scan looks like. Let's already assume you have identified your application inputs and we can also feed that into, uh, I'll just go back in here. We can also feed that into Zap by manually navigating with the Zap browser. So if I go into login register and open this up, that should show up here within the tree, uh, the sites tree. So if I go back in here, there we are. If I go to a different page, maybe this one here. So extract data. Uh, we'll just click on extract data there. You will see that that should load up somewhere here. Uh, and it'll also be visible in your history. But I'll go back into the login page and I'll just specify some test parameters. So we know that this is injectable, right? So how would we find out whether it's vulnerable or automate that process? And secondly, automate the process of identifying the payloads to use that verify the injection. So I'll just hit login here. Again, we're not intercepting the request. If we go into the history, you can see that post request there. If we view the request, we can see that uh, the parameter is within the body here uh, and not contained within the actual URL, which is perfectly fine. What we want to do is right click on the request here and uh, we want to send this to the fuzzer. All right, so in the fuzzer, what we want to do is if you're doing this manually or you know this is your the first obviously we have context from the previous video but you need to identify the injectable parameter given that this is a login form what we would need to do is modify the uh, the body of the request here 
and this is a post request and get rid of the the actual parameter we specified there. This is typically what works and I like having it spaced as follows. So I'll save that now. And then I want to double click on that space here to actually select it, all right? So if I just select it like so, I then need to add a fuzz location. So this is where you'd specify your payloads. With Zap and the fuzzer and the way it works, you uh, specify where you want as, um, where you want the fuzzer to inject your payloads, the testing payloads, and then you click on Add to add that as a location, and you want to add a payload now. And the, the reason why I used Zap is because Zap has a pre-built set of um, SQL injection. Uh, payloads under file fuzzers, you want to go to the JBro fuzz and uh, you want to navigate all the way to SQL injection right over here and just select everything, even if it's not valid based on the database you're targeting. Of course, if this is your first time doing this, you don't know what database is running, but uh, this is a collection of payloads. So you can see if I select this one, it sort of gives you a list of payloads that it will run and we can see the ones we ran here. So for example, this one here, it'll run, uh, it'll run them with different permutations uh, just to see what works. And it's really the response to these um, fuzzing requests that we want to pay attention to. So I'll add that there and hit OK. And what this means is that these payloads will now be injected in the username parameter here. For the options, we don't need to change anything. We don't need to follow redirects at the moment. We can just hit Start Fuzzer. That's going to bring up the fuzzer. And now you're not going to get a um, you're not going to be told directly by Zap that, hey, this looks vulnerable or this payload works. Uh, what you want to pay attention to is the reflected state. When it says reflected, it means that uh, this appears to be, at least in this case, a form or a validation of error-based injection. And I'll explain how that works. So we're currently at 56%. I'm just going to wait for this to complete and you'll see what I mean. All right, so just going to wait for this to complete and I'm just going to filter then by reflected. The point is that not all of the results here with the state set to reflected are indications of valid SQL injection, in this case, error-based injection. What this essentially tells you is what payloads look like they're working. So I'll just filter by state here. So when we say reflected in Zap, what this means is that this the payload or what the parameter that was input was reflected back by the web application. In essence, it's saying, hey, this could be a potential in-band SQL injection attack in that whatever was injected was reflected back or the data was reflected back either in the form of an error, but typically or commonly in the form of an error. So when we say that the payload used here was A and it was reflected back, you can see that that's a false positive because it's highlighting uh, the word A in the word transitional in the response. That's not an indication of injection. If we take a look at this one here, where we say A uh, is was provided as the parameter and then the single quote was used uh, to terminate the, the actual string literal, and we said or one equals one, and then we use the uh, SQL terminator there or delimiter and comments, if we click on that, we can see that the, it's reflected back as part of an as part of a message for the uh, page process login attempt.php where it says SQL query handler account exists, which means this payload will work. So essentially, what Zap has done for you is it's gone through its pre uh, predefined list of payloads that it comes with, the SQL injection payloads. And again, as I said, be aware of false positives like the A option here. So it's essentially told you that, hey, this was reflected back. And based on the response here, if we take a look at the web page itself, it looks like th this particular payload works. So there's only one way we can verify this, right? And the way we can verify this is uh, simply by copying this. So uh, what we can do is, again, just try and test it out. So. Uh, in um, in its current state, if we go back here, we know that it's saying we need to say, uh, I can't really copy that, but uh, we're using or, so we'll say or one equals one, and then we use the delimiter and then space double comment, hit login. And in this case, we get an error and it tells us that we're logged in. So 
the syntax is not correct, obviously, but can you imagine this? Can you imagine that Zap did this for us uh, without doing anything? So again, uh, this works really well. However, be aware of false positives because you need to perform the testing yourself to verify whether the payload works. This was also reflected back where it says this payload will work. So let's try it as is. So we'll say A and then single quote. And in this case, uh, it is the double hyphen, which is comment. This is something that we couldn't even do previously using the predefined payload. So I will just hit login. In this case, it looks like that didn't work. So I'll just, without specifying the A option here, I'll just say A and let's run that as is. That did not work. So A double comment and try that here. There we are. So that produces an error. So it's reflected back. In this case, it says that the account exists, which is uh, very interesting indeed. So that doesn't look like it works, but uh, there we are. It looks like, yeah, so th this points to the standard single quote um, error-based injection payload. And then we have this one here. And if we take a look at this one here, we can see that there. And then we have one here that looks interesting. This is again using the logical operator. So uh, in this case, instead of saying one equals one, we say or uh, two is greater than one, which is always going to be true. So we can try this out. So you can see there's different permutations of the payload, which uh, is something I really like. Um, so, you know, we can say or uh, and we may need to change a few things or two equals is greater than one, sorry. And we hit login. In this case, it doesn't log us in. The reason for that may be very simple. And that could be down to the fact that we didn't specify the comment there. And there we are. So just a little bit of uh, testing and we get what we are looking for. So there's a couple of others. So for example, union select, it looks like that account exists. Well, we can obviously try it out. Uh, so we say uh, union select and uh, we, you know, we can obviously try and see whether it produces an error. It probably will. There we are. So union select. Um, we can in this case say um, it's limited to one, but we can say select password from accounts. So let's try that out. Actually, not a bad place to try this out. So we'll say uh, the payload in this case is union select. So we can say union select um, password, password or passwords as it were um, from accounts. And let's use the comment there. Well, we can change this as always. In this particular case, it's saying that they have a different number of columns, which is uh, interesting. So yeah, we can use union. They just have a different number of columns. So, you know, a bit of testing. Uh, this one we've already tested. It looks like we have a different permutation. It looks like the having one works as well. So this uses a different uh, SQL query or SQL command. In this case, it's the having command. So we say having one equals one. And we use the comment option there. This might not work for the bypass. So it still generates an error, which proves uh, it's working. So we can say having uh, one equals one. And if we now say the pound symbol, it says that account doesn't exist, but that is passed in successfully. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. I wonder what happens if we say um, having one equals one, because that was reflected back. It may, it, uh, could probably not apply to this particular page or this application input, which is where we would then use something like um, uh, user info. So let's go back in here. If we tried something like that here, so we can say having one equals one. A bad name or password. So we can say having in this case, I think we would need to use the double hyphen. Sorry, having uh, if I can type that in one equals one. Although this is on a different page, you can see it generates that error. Uh, I think what might be the case here is this. So um, having one equals one, sorry, 
There we are. So yeah, that, that doesn't obviously we're testing it on the wrong application input where we did the fuzzing. So always stick to and this is what I was talking about in the slides uh, in, in the intro set of video of this uh, section. You never want to start uh, testing different payloads and different application inputs. Um, but yeah, this also looks like it works. Uh, actually, this is a syntax error. So this one didn't work. So pay attention to the output. Uh, this one is false positive. Uh, this one exists, so one equals one. We're already aware of that payload. Uh, nothing else reflected. So these are the only payloads that work on this application input, right? Um, we can obviously, and I'll, we'll, we, we can do this right now. What we'll do is uh, we will go into this, uh, into our history, and we'll go back into uh, Firefox here, and uh, we will go into injection and SQL map practice and uh, the someone's blog option here, and we'll select one of these options. So Simba, for example, view the blog entries for that user. So zero blog entries, that should be highlighted here, the post. If we take a look at the request, we can see it. So we send this to the fuzzer and it's pretty much the same process. Uh, I'm just going to edit this here and get rid of that there. And then I'm going to add a space, save it. And as I said, I like injecting or specifying that as a space and add. And we'll go into the file fuzzers and we'll go into SQL injection and select everything here. And let's see whether there's some other payloads that we uh, we couldn't find in here. And uh, you can find some other additional uh, file fuzzers or OSP zap uh, files that you can use for fuzzing. There's also others contained within. Uh, so for example, I'll just show you this here within sec lists or the sec list word list, but I'll show you that in a second. Uh, so there we'll start the fuzzer. And again, we're looking for anything reflected, but we still need to verify it. So there's going to be quite a lot of false positives, obviously. Um, but let's see. In this particular case, it doesn't look like we're getting that much luck, but uh, we'll we'll let it go. You can see it's also a mix of union, boolean, um, etc. So we'll see what works in any in any case. Uh, at the end of the day, manual te uh, testing always takes a precedent over you know sort of a semi-automated approach like this. In this particular case, looks like we're only getting a few that look like they reflected successfully, which is very interesting. Um, and the reason why it's not being reflected, as you can obviously tell, is because this is blind um, uh, for the most part. Now, obviously, this this looks done, and these ones look like they work here. So this is this record here. If we take a look at the response, SQL query handler get blo blog record. Look like it works. So one equals one. Union select seems like it's working. So the typical logical operators are working and nothing else. So yeah, that also works as well. And of course, we can test any of these out. So if we go back into Firefox, just showing you the robustness, we need to modify the request. Um, so if we go in here and uh, we will actually send this to the request editor, and uh, yeah, so we already have that payload inserted. This is one of the great things with uh, Zap that I really like. So we've sent it and we have the response here. And uh, let's take a look at the response. So the response is usually at the bottom because we have the header pages that are displayed there. Uh, hold on. There we are. So actually, hold on, there's no real area or I can't see it at least as to where this could have been uh, displayed back. Um, hold on, I think the best way of testing this then would be to obviously just use the payload and test it ourselves. Um, I think in this case, what what would be missing would be that there. So let's send it and let's see the response now. Uh, that's probably null. So we need to resort to some form of manual testing using the delimiter there. So go back in here. Uh, we need to modify it in the request, but that should work. Um, we can't really... Uh, um, I don't want to show it side by side. 
Uh, we don't generate anything there. Let's actually, yeah, we can do this with something like Zap, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much the idea. It's just a response that uh, what I'm looking for specifically in here is just a change. So if I say, let's get rid of this here, the response in this case is 53,806 bytes. This is sort of a time-based or size data-based approach, uh, 53. Um, if I add that in here, that's still gonna give me sort of a similar output, 798, yeah, so again, we can test this manually by intercepting and then sending it and seeing what the response looks like. Uh, that's not an issue per se. Uh, but yeah, that's how you can utilize uh, OASP Zap to fuzz or to perform SQL injection fuzzing to identify payloads or identify whether vulnerability exists because it will run it for you. And if it is reflected, uh, there's a good chance that you want to test that out. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, the, as I said, the great thing that I like is it has support for multiple types of databases. So, you know, if I go into the fuzzer, just to show you the actual, uh, I'll just select this here as the fuzz location as an example. If we go into the file fuzzers right over here, and uh, we have multiple types, you know, you have HTTP fuzzers, uh, injection, this is where you have, uh, you know, cross-site scripting injection, SQL injection, passive, and you click on either of them, it'll tell you what payloads they're going to use. The great thing is you can take all of those payloads within this GitHub repo, and you can create your own, which is pretty cool, if you ask me. I mean, that's uh, pretty sweet. Um, and then, you know, you have a huge collection of payloads that you can always have ready uh, at hand or on hand. And uh, why don't we try this, actually? Let's try and use our own. Um, uh, what I'll do is let's save this as uh, uh, I think it's a great exercise in any case. So I'll say save and we'll say SQLI, uh, SQLI fuzz and uh, what format does, are there any format requirements here? Don't look like, um, if we say custom fuzzers, file fuzzers, uh, we can actually just use a file here. So if I say file, uh, comment token, pale. yeah, that should work just fine. We actually don't need to use a file fuzzer. There we are. So we'll just say file .txt, and uh, we then I'm just going to save it here. Uh, desktop SQLI, and uh, I'll save it there. There we are. So now we'll browse for it on my desktop open and the payload should be in here. Um, yeah, so this, uh, this should be very interesting. So we'll add this here. Okay. And now we will modify the location, actually, we need to do that, uh, but we'd say, remove, and uh, I'll get rid of this here. And I'll need to edit that there, get rid of that here. And uh, sure you can use your own payloads, you get a good collection of them, you'll always have a much easier time identifying them. So let me just select that there, add and we'll use our own. So file, browse, desktop, SQL, injection, add, hit OK, and start fuzzer. All right, now we're talking. And so now we have a much larger, a much wider variety of payloads that we can use. And again, we're just looking for anything, at least in this case, not really reflected, but there we are. You can see we have some very interesting, this is a syntax error, so false positive, uh, wrong syntax. Uh, that one looks like it worked. So much wider, you know, type or variety of payloads. Uh, you may choose to append uh, with the actual uh, string delimiter or the single quote, it's entirely up to you, but uh, you get the idea. So that is going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so that is how to identify uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities semi-automatically uh, with OASP Zap. Uh, and that comes or brings us to the end of this section of the course I was focused on the process of identifying SQL injection vulnerabilities, both manually and automatically. As I said, we'll be covering the usage of SQL map uh, 
or SQL map uh, in the next sections when we'll, we'll be focusing purely on exploitation. Um, so in the next section, we'll be getting started by taking a look at how to exploit uh, both um, error-based and uh, union-based SQL injection vulnerabilities in real-world web applications that are much less friendly than OWASP Motilidae. But hopefully, uh, by the end of this section, you should have seen the value of Motilidae. It really is a great way to understand what's going on in the background with regards to queries and uh, the differences between integer and string-based um, injection or parameters. So with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video.